Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the MinMax Show podcast, a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hansen, and I'm thanking you for being here in every which way. We also have Suriel Vasquez here. Hello. We also have Kyle Hilliard here. Hello. And, of course, we also have Janet Garcia here. Welcome, Janet. Hey. Hey. Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, this is kind of like a funky-themed show we got going on, where... Suriel noticed a certain trend. A lot of us in the industry noticed a certain trend around E3, and we're going to lean into it here by talking about the Game Boy Advance. And we'll get to all that fun stuff, take a big, nostalgic trip down memory lane talking about the Game Boy Advance. By the way, Leo's going to be joining us for the second half of the show with community questions. But before we get to any of that funky stuff, let's go for some good old vanilla game talk. You know, like the good old days, like last week. Um, Scarlet Nexus is a game that just came out from Bandai Namco. Janet, have you checked it out, or is it just uh, Kyle and Surreal? I actually have played about an hour of it, um, so I'm super early in, but I'm enjoying the combat so far. I'm still very much, like, barely out of the tutorial area, but it has that telekinetic ability thing, and I'm a sucker for that in any game. I love it in Control. I was into it in Bioshock. Spoilers for those games. If you still haven't played them, go play them. They're good. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to play more of it, but uh, a little too early to make a hard assessment. The monsters are also horrifying looking, which I love. Okay, so, yeah. So uh, good, good news, Janet. That tutorial... Still going strong about five hours in, so... <laughs> oh, I can't wait. Let's just... You know, I have a lot more to learn, so that's that's okay. Yeah, so Scarlet Nexus, um, it is out on damn near everything. It's not on Switch, though, is it? I don't mm, I believe know, I so. Not. Okay, but it's a big action RPG. Feels a little bit like a stylish action game, but it definitely seems like combat is the star of the show. But, Suriel, I'm curious, like, from your expertise arena of the stylish action games like are you enjoying this thing yeah i like it i think that it is very different from a lot of action games in that it feels like an rpg because it is less about okay do do the cool thing how to do and keep doing that and more about do what the encounters are telling you to because every enemy feels like they're keyed into specific ways of like okay this thing has a shell around it so you have to throw a bunch of objects on it at it or like this one is like there are uh objects that you can douse uh enemies uh with and that'll make them wet and then you can use electricity to deal a lot of damage but what i like about it is that it it because of that you feel very comfortable with the flow because you know what you're doing there, like at any specific point of like okay they teach you how to do like here's the regular three hit combo and then you can do Y to do an attack that kind of pushes you away I'm playing as one of two characters Kasane who ha who is kind of like the more uh, long range character so you can do that and then you can follow up that up with a throw with like a telekinesis throw um, and so that feels very good to do because it feels like you're, do you're doing what the game is telling you to but uh, it it still feels like, okay, I'm doing this correctly, so it feels nice to be able to, like, just go with that flow of combat. And it, and it, I think it, it, I think does distinguish itself from other action games that way. Yeah. So you're, where are you at? Red hot on this thing? Lukewarm on this thing? I like the combat of it quite a bit. I think that, like, you, you, on top of all of that, like, you get a bunch of, um, party members and basically, like, the, they're running around and doing stuff, but their kind of major contribution is that you can basically, like power yourself up with their abilities so you know like uh, a party member will give you like their electric power or their ability to duplicate or you know like their ability to slow down time and all that stuff is really cool and i like all of that combat stuff but like right now it's definitely leaning a lot into its story yeah so i feel like i'm not doing as much combat as i would want to be because I, it feels like the game is constantly like okay You've you've done about let's say ten to twenty minutes of combat. Now time for like okay, uh, ten minutes of like a visual novel style narrative, which isn't bad. Like I actually think the story is kind of interesting, but the 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 writing I think is really like laborious and not and like they'll they'll show you a concept and it's like oh maybe this thing might happen might be happening to people. I think this thing might be happening to people, and then like two hours later it's like wait. Do you guys think this thing might be happening to people? Yeah. Like it is that kind of writing style mixed with like a lot of like here's a bunch here's a couple portraits talking to each other. Um but like I like where the story is going. It's just it's just taking way too long to get there. Yeah, it's a very very anime and they call it uh their phrasing is that it's brain punk is the vibe here cuz yeah, what okay I played the opening and I'm still trying to wrap my mind around what is going on with the enemies of this thing. It's like all fusions of humans and like 
uh, household objects. It's like a lamp with legs and <laughs> what is going there on? There are others, dude. I don't know what, oh, what else do you need. Oh, others. others. Yeah. There is, I, I don't know, maybe, sir, how far in are you? Do you know? Do I'm you like 10 hours in at this point. Okay, it so you're probably like, further you just than me. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I feel I, like I, I hit a point where it's like, not a, it's not a twist necessarily, but it's like an interesting element of the others has now emerged where I'm like more intrigued and in finding out more at this point. But it took me a while to get there in terms of the story, you know? Yeah. And like early on, it does broadcast a lot of like, are we the baddies vibes? Because, you know, like you're the enemies are called others. You're part of the OSF, which is like meant to eradicate them. There's a lot of... um almost like propaganda style like newscasts where after every mission like the you'll you'll see like a broadcast that it's like oh the osf was was doing this great thing they're so cool everybody loves the osf like killing the others that's what we want and and like they'll interview like uh, early on they interview a couple of your party members um and they are doing something interesting where you play you can play as one of two characters yeah um and it's not a, it's not like a swap it's not like a palette swap they are distinct characters and i'm playing as kasane i'm uh yuito i think is the character is the male character yeah that's who i'm playing as yeah so i'm, I'm crossing paths with him quite a bit um so it, it does feel like oh you should play both both characters stories to kind of get the full thing i'm not sure how long that would take i i wonder if it's like a hey we expect this schedule to- yeah. If it's like 30 hours if you do both or like it's a 60 hour game like Fire Emblem Three Houses where it's like, oh, in order to get the full story, you have to pl- do like, oh, like basically an entirely new playthrough. Well, it says so, curious so to see how different they are. Yeah. So the main story, at least in how long to beat, puts it at 22 hours. So I would imagine that doesn't include then jumping over to the other character's perspective. Yeah. So it, it does seem like it, it'll be a, a little much. But I think at that like right now, I feel like I'm reaching the crest where like I think I have all the components of combat. Uh, where it's like, okay, you, I have four abilities that I can use. I have, you know, several different weapons, or not several different weapons, but like I have upgrades and stuff. I have a skill tree that I'm filling out that I'm like part, most of the way through. And it feels like, okay, now that I know all the verbs that I can pull off here, I feel like I'm properly mixing and matching depending on what encounters want to do. And they're still introducing new enemies of like, okay, this this enemy is going to shield itself whenever you get close. So you have to slow down time so you can hit it before it does that. And they have stagger meters, things like that, that you can do finishers on. Like there are really cool environmental abilities. So like there's one uh, part where you can just like grab a train and just like ram it into people if you, ha- if you have <laughs> enough uh, telekinesis. Uh, and it, like and they do it very put- obvious, like very Mario style where it's like, okay, here's an encounter there's just a bunch of enemies on this on this train track just grab the train and just destroy all of them it's really cool there's one (laughs) there's one other one later on where you take a chandelier and rip it from the ceiling and it turns into a spinning top and it's like an analog spinning top where you're like as you're moving it you're kind of having it collide with enemies like by moving the analog stick so a lot of stuff is really cool but i feel like if i were to do another playthrough of this and if yuito isn't like super different from kasane i don't know that i i'll stick with it for another whole play i mean i don't know if it's expecting you to stick with it for another whole playthrough here though is it well because it, it feels like right now they they are dropping like I, 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 I'm I curious to see what the end is like because there's definitely like a plot point where I'm like, oh, obviously I would have to follow Yuita's storyline to see, to get, to kind of get the full story. Gotcha, right? in this gotcha. Thing. I think it's as much as Fire Emblem Three Houses wants you to play through uh, all of the character storylines and that it's like, you don't have to, but it's going to give you the full picture. Yeah. That's, so, so, that's sort of where I put this. Yeah, and Kyle, you're, you're still digging it too, huh? Yeah, I mean, I think... A, one, a, a big compliment I can give it is like I do see myself finishing it. I do my, see myself. Yeah, I'll probably like, do like I think like I'm that. into it enough at this point, you know. Yeah, yeah, and it's just the combat. I, I the characters are interesting. I mean, they they borrow a little from, uh, I mean, I guess Persona you could say, or maybe the Tales series, where you have these opportunities to go like engage with characters on individual basis, and sometimes that's like you meet them at a restaurant to go eat food. Sometimes it's like you go on a walk. Sometimes it's a combat mission, and then you're rewarded with actual, uh, like stuff you know for doing that like the that partner character becomes more powerful and, and that kind of thing and like gotcha it is in the beginning it's a lot of characters that look similar getting title cards and i'm being like i'm not i don't know who this is yet like i, I that guy kind of looks like the last guy but I, he seems important but like i've now hit a point where i've been able to go have individual conversations with everyone where i'm like okay i actually want to know what's up with this guy and i'll and i will 
talk to him every chance I get. And I, and he does now look different than the other person, you know? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, those conversations I think are interesting and in that Kasane is a very cold character and a lot of characters are like, okay, you need, you need to, like you, you were doing the right thing. You just don't know how to approach it because you like, you've kind of just grown up around your sister, uh, Naomi, and you, this is the only person you care about. You're really cold with other people like th- that you were trying to do the right thing but like you need to go about it in a more friendly way so i feel like this is a very shonen uh storyline where it's like oh, it's kind yeah. of teaching yeah. you how to behave around people where it's like okay here's like you're kind of socially awkward but and we're going to try to like show you like uh, uh well that you kind of botch that situation so like here's maybe a way you can maybe tackle it a little bit better but and but those conversations i think are interesting like the side conversations you can have yeah. a lot of characters accusing my character of having crushes on other characters oh be, be it's that type of game anyone would ever make that assumption oh, okay and now good I get old it. shonen stuff yeah yeah so it is like the director of from some of the Tales games, like I guess he directed Tales of Zillia 2 and the producers also oh, from the Tales surprising. series okay, and stuff. Cool. So yeah, at least from the starting area, I didn't get too many huge RPG vibes, but it's nice. It seems like it grows in that direction compared to the stylish action direction, which is seems like it could be somewhere in that mix between the two. But that's cool. Uh, Scarlet Nexus, will we be talking about it at the end of the year? Maybe? Potentially. Potentially. Yeah. At least to be like, hey, what do you all think of do you all remember Scarlet Nexus? Like at yes. least I feel like I feel like someone one of us will say it. We'll mention it. One I of think. us will utter the word Scarlet Nexus. Yes. But yeah, you can check I that out. I, it, yeah. it will be a game that I beat in twenty twenty one, I think. There so, it is, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> he promises. Um also we'll probably... the category games we finished, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more uh, next week, but Mario Golf Super Rush also came out uh, on Friday and Janet and Kyle, you've been playing it? Yeah, I wish I had the case. It's over like on the other side of my TV. But yes, I, I put in like four hours of it. My classic four hours that Friday stream. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, quick, just quick thoughts. Yeah. I like it more than I thought I would. Like I'm, I'm playing it more than I expected myself to, which is which is cool. OK, I also like it more than I thought I would, but it's still not enough to have been OK buying it outside of content. I literally only bought it to stream it. So I'm just like, <laughs> all right. Well, OK, I, I still don't have a read because I like Mario sports games, but I'm not diehard. I'm one of those people that, you know, lost sleep for like six Ooh. months back when like Mario Tennis came out on the Switch. But like, God, do I get that? I don't know. All these Mario sports games get a solid eight out of ten. You can live without it. So I'm trying to figure out, do I need to dive into Mario Golf Super Rush? So I, I reviewed Mario Tennis Switch at Game Informer. Yeah. I like, and I think I gave it like an eight. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I like this You're part more. of the problem. I'm part of the problem. I like this more than that. I like the sort of wow. uh, like leveling mechanics. Like there's, it's a you know light RPG kind of, and it like they're they're so that that part is like engaging me more than I thought because it's also like I'm on a really hard course right now, and even though I don't, even though I've like played it multiple times without beating it, I'm still leveling up, and my you know I'm I'm still hitting the ball harder as I progress and stuff like that, which I've been enjoying. Okay, so we can hit the ball harder. So kind of run don't walk to play mario Kart super you all seem woefully unenthused about this game which i is mean well, you're well, in an I'm, awkward spot because like you're most people that talk to me about this game are like i either like you know mario sports and i'm like i was interested i'm like well if you were interested you're probably still gonna be interested like just because yeah. i don't like it like i i went in feeling like i wasn't gonna like it and i left liking it more than i thought but still not like loving it um so i feel like those are the two camps that are best to be in you either know you don't like it or you yeah. feel like you're, you're gonna want it you're in between like i don't think i can help you because it's okay. just like it i don't think it's fire enough to be a game you know which in my dreams it's like oh wow i thought this was gonna be just basic but it's really good it didn't really hit that for me yeah but it wasn't like bad so i think if you okay. have people maybe you want to play with because i do feel like i and kyle i don't know how much you, well we're gonna talk about it later but i went a little into the campaign and it was all right but i feel like it's best with other people so i think if you have people you know, spend the six to get it physical. If you don't like it, give it to GameStop later. Like, that's what I did. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just for playing online with the speed rush mode and all that stuff. But yeah. also, Hanson, you were yeah. like, you, but you started this conversation. Like, we'll talk about it more later. So I'm keeping my thoughts very brisk. Okay. To like, okay. I like it a lot, but I didn't want to like. So you can talk about, about it more later you. with us. <laughs> okay. All right. If you, you mentioned that it's better with other people, does it feel like, like, if I'm having a, like a game night with people and, and like we're tired of like, 
Smash Brothers and, and Mario Party. Does this feel like one we could go to where it's like, oh, we'll play Mario Golf while we're waiting for pizza? Is that Does that feel like where this game is at? Or does it feel like, well, you have to have a dedicated group of Mario golfers? You think it's decent to jump into? Like, my brother jumped in cold, and I taught him very quickly how to play um, after only having played, like, an hour or two myself. But uh, it still depends on, like, how... The pizza, the pizza needs to not arrive that far out because yeah. <laughs> okay. if you don't like it, I do feel like it's the kind of game that you'll be like kind of annoyed. But that's kind of always the case when you're playing with other people. Um, like, I don't see this popping off in my apartment. Um, so mm, maybe. OK, Just buy it. And then you have it. <laughs> Just the wise well, words. Have. Mario Golf Super Rush, everybody. Um, OK. Let's stay on this Nintendo train here because we're talking about the Game Boy Advance. Uh, it just had its 20th anniversary back in early June here, but the beloved little handheld. Um, it seems like, oh, Janet has hers physically. Very cool. Yeah, do you all cool. still have your Game Boy Advance or a Game Boy Advance? It's not my original one as a kid. I don't. Yeah, I, have have a, a, I have like an SP with the nice LED screen. That's like my I'm hanging on to this one forever Game Boy Advance. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I would love what you and Cyril have, which is like the first model for those the cr- listening. The one. Um, I would love yeah. that with like properly backlit LED. That would probably yeah. be like my favorite one to hang on to for it sure. Yeah, I actually, I really want to get the um, and and this is like not this is not sponsored, and I've never like talked to them. But the, there's a site <laughs> called God of Gaming that did um, they do like really nice mods, and I got one for my brother a GBA one backlit, and you can like get the rechargeable battery and stuff. Ooh. Like that's what I want to get. Oh, this is like an, a regular yeah. version. So I got like the warm light with it. If y'all remember that struggle, oh, yeah. like that, mm-hmm. it's yeah. like, oh my god, you take a bad, a bad flashlight to a bad screen, and you have a good time because it's the Game Boy Advance. And then you put a magnifying glass over on it to. Oh no, this is the one really that make yeah, it look has better, the magnification. But it certainly makes it look bigger. <laughs> oh yeah, that's you know, it's the one. Like playing on a like, movie theater screen, it's amazing. <laughs> it, it was specifically a problem with this model because I don't remember having that same issue with like the Game Boy Color as much, right? It feels like it was something about the original Game Boy Advance model. No, I think you you were pro- well. I don't know. Maybe I wonder if you were just more cynical, honestly. You yeah. know, Could- was it also an issue of like, well, we need to get a lamp here so I can actually play. Like, turn the light on. I'm still playing. I'm still trying to get through this gym leader, and this battle is taking way longer because I brought the wrong Pokemon. I mean, my, <laughs> my early okay. Game Boy Advance memories were sitting at a desk with a desk lamp, like a proper desk lamp over it, and playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 a lot. Oh, like, that's wow. how I spent that's a good, the majority that one's also of on my Game list. Boy Advance okay. time. And then you get a sunburn on your hands. Um, yeah. It's a real elaborate <laughs> process there. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is relevant. We insist because of E3, right? It was a weird timing coincidence, uh, more than likely, where the Nintendo Direct seemed to be a giant love letter to fans of the GBA with like a new WarioWare. We got the sequel to Metroid Fusion, Advance Wars remake. It feels like it's a good time to, to go back and, and look at some of this weird stuff and count down our three favorite games for the system overall. Um, I uh, dug into the history a little bit of the Game Boy Advance, and it's uh, more murky than I was expecting. There's stuff like... Uh, there was something called Project Atlantis that people were just swirling about. Everyone was talking about this uh, back in like 1996. Um, and it wasn't revealed then until a GDC talk in 2009 where somebody from Nintendo actually showed a slideshow and had like, ah, oh, here's like the earliest version of the Game Boy Advance. And it's like predating the design and it looks like vertical, like the original Game Boy. And so now some people are like, oh, that was probably the rumors surrounding project atlantis that eventually become the game boy advance but it's cool that you get to see some early glimpse of it but uh according to ign on their site back when they announced the game boy advance they really had a bold take here from nintendo uh ign said back in 1999 when this thing was revealed not only is nintendo planning to make the game boy advance a powerful gaming handheld the company has big plans for connectivity as well the system we will be able to connect to cellular phones to access the internet which will enable gamers to download games participate in multiplayer games and chat and exchange email with friends the company also plans to release an advanced version of the game boy camera which will let gamers see the face of the person they're playing against these were the talking mm. points from Nintendo at the big reveal for the Game Boy Advance, which, I mean, I yeah. guess they get the connectivity angle with the link cable to the GameCube, and so maybe they're like, eh, that's, that's good enough. But 
the so, idea of it being that like stuff came around with DS eventually, like web browsing and right. But it seems like it wasn't like until like DSI where they really were leaning into kind of the online capabilities in a big mm-hmm. way, which was years and years down the road. But it's fun to look back at yeah. what could have been. I, I wonder if that has a lot to do with them. I think they also had the, the the GameCube network adapter, right? And like a lot of the 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 stuff from Japan definitely felt like, oh, we like this. I think would work in Japan, but then I think the maybe they just did market research on like stuff like the U.S. on other territories, and they realized like, yeah, their internet is nowhere near capable enough to handle this stuff, so it would be a complete failure. And so they had a lot of ideas that in theory would work if the internet was as, as prevalent as it was today. Yeah. Or if that stuff was like embedded in the device versus like, well, you have to buy this peripheral and then figure out how to make it work online. Yeah. I'm just bummed we didn't get to see the Game Boy Camera Advance. I want to see what that would yeah. look like. That's such a funky did you, idea. Did you also see the stuff about like all the card reader stuff that they had for it? Oh, like yeah. I mean, on? yeah. I mean, that was, did anybody get the whole card reader and scan those weirdo things? I... I didn't, but I was I was working at a GameStop when that came out, and there was like a dedicated group of people who would come in and buy every pack of Animal Crossing e card. You yeah, know what I mean, uh, like, like it was like they would just certain people would just come in and buy out the whole stock the second we got them uh, because of that. But yeah, the, I remember we had one on display, but I never I never felt the desire to own one. You know, there was nothing ever compelling enough for me to to get one. Yeah. yeah, and now An early amiibo prototype. Yeah, <laughs> yeah honestly, kinda, yeah. yeah. Now Animal Crossing fans are much more reasonable with all physical mm-hmm. things. Um, okay, should we get into the top three <laughs> games? No. <laughs> uh, let's see, Janet. What is your third favorite game for oh, third favorite? Game Boy okay, um, I think Wireland Four would probably Ooh, be one for ah, me. Um, I really loved this game as a kid, and I've you know the the Wario franchise in general. It's sort of hit or miss for me, but this is one that I felt like they really hit the nail on, like all of the level design it's so playful like i love the goofy stuff like his face gets like bloated and inflated to like float through the level there's that one like plant boss that i like have a very i was you know watching um like a no commentary let's play to like refresh my memory on this game and like it was like instantly unlocking all of these childhood memories for me which was so cool like i played the hell out of that game even though I actually think it's fairly short. Like I forgot how short games used to be on these handhelds, like which is really odd in the in the era of where we're always talking about game length and oh, do we feel like this is long enough at 10 out? I'm like, these games (laughs) took like an afternoon, but I would spend so long with them. Um, But yeah, that's what I really like. And I feel like it doesn't get highlighted quite as often because it's not like as wavy of a franchise, but I really like it still. I think it holds up. Yeah, yeah. This is really peak era for really confusing Nintendo numbers. Because it's like, okay, we had the Super Mario Land series, then Super Mario Land 3 was Wario Land 1, and then that was the spinoff for then continuing the Wario Land franchise. But then the part that blows my mind, and this is like primo early Game Boy Advance memories for me, was like playing Super Mario Bros. 2, which was called Super Mario Advance on the Game Boy Advance. Then it gets so messy, because then Super Mario Advance 2 was Mario World. Super Mario Advance 3 That's was right. Yoshi's Island. Super Mario Advance 4 was Super Mario Brothers 3. It's like, what is even happening yeah. anymore? It's impossible to keep track, but yet it's baked yeah. into our souls and we'll remember it on our deathbed. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, yeah, Wario, I, Land's, I, Wario Land 1 is actually like uh, more of a staple for me than I think I've ever talked about. Like I played that more than most Mario games. <laughs> I mean, the original Wario Land. Probably some of the best art on the original Game Boy. Like there's so much personality yeah, packed great. into all those Wario Land games. Yeah. yeah. And like depending on how many coins you have at the end of the game, like depends on how big your castle is. Like you can have like a little shack or you can have a huge mansion. It was it was a, a weird thing to discover without internet back in the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, great choice, great choice. Um, yeah. That's one that I, I've started up a couple times because like, uh, the real lasting legacy of the Game Boy Advance for me now is just getting in that Nintendo DS Ambassador program where they gave you all those Game Boy Advance games. So like, I have Wario Land in that bundle and I've always I've started up a couple times and hadn't gotten as far as I would like. But it does seem good and cool. Um, Serial, number three for you? Uh, yeah, my number three kind of speaks to what I think a lot of my experience was with this console, which was playing a lot of ports that I didn't have the chance to play yeah. when I was a kid. So I, uh, and I think probably the one that I, I, I think felt very personal to me was probably Final Fantasy V. 
Oh, uh, wow. Because, you know, like that was the first time I played Link to the Past. You know, that was the first yep. time I played Super Mario World, Super Mario Brothers 3. No, uh, 3 I actually did play on NES. But like a lo- seeing a lot of these games of like, oh, now you can take this like classic game that you may not have a ton of experience with on the go was like a really cool thing back then. I mean, yeah, the games were like $30 a piece, but it felt like, okay, they're not doing this with everything yet. So it feels special when you get to see this uh, release. But like 5 was definitely the game that... Uh, it felt like, okay, they, they've nailed the formula with Final Fantasy here. Uh, it feels like I really like the class system. I, for some reason, really ended up liking the story, even though it felt pretty close to Final Fantasy 1 in that they didn't have a ton of, like, specifically, like, strong characters in the way that 4 and 6 did. There was, like, people like Bards and stuff, but, like, it felt more tuned to be, like, customize your characters, you know, like, this class can evolve, unlocks this class if you level it up enough, and it felt really flexible that way. But, like, I remember um, X-Death, the bad guy from that game, um, feeling like one of those villains that was, like, okay, they're, they're, they just want to destroy the world, they want to, like, return the world to nothingness, but they are, they are on it in terms of, like, not letting anything go, where it's just like, oh, like, uh, we'll have to let them escape or whatever, it's like, we'll tie them up, and then, like, I'll tell you my plan, and then you escape or whatever, I remember there was a a moment where he's like, no, I'm just going to kill this character, because, like, (laughs) he is getting in my way, he's done, I don't like him, uh, like, I'm not, I'm not gonna mince any words, and I'm not gonna let anyone get away with anything, and I was like, oh, man, this guy is, this guy's like not messing around in a way that it was kind of cool for that for that uh for that series where it felt like a lot of it was very tropey and like you know yeah. very character driven do you uh, so, think yeah, you'll, that game was great do you think you'll ever go back to final fantasy 5 because it's releasing on steam and mobile at the end of july apparently i, I still have my game Boy advance copy and it feels right. like that's the best state of that game will ever be in in a lot of ways unless you know i buy the game and then uh the steam version and then mod it but uh yeah, like I, 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 that is maybe the Final Fantasy that I think back to pretty fondly from those like early Final Fantasies. Yeah, but I mean, you're totally right. I mean, ports were so huge on the Game Boy Advance. Yeah. Like Yoshi's Island, this is really where I sunk in the most time in Yoshi's Island and really learned to love it, even though this version of Yoshi's Island, they added sound effects and a lot of boing hops and all that stuff that I understand the hardcore Yoshi's Island fans are not down with, but even like, yeah, Link I to actually, the Past. Like, I played a lot of Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo, Yeah, but, but Game Boy Advance was the first time I beat it. Oh, wow. Which, yeah, so, I, yeah, and Yoshi's Island was a staple for me, too. Like, I, 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 played, I played and completed 100% of that game on Super Nintendo, but when it came to Game Boy Advance, all, yeah, all over again, I was, I was all back in. Yeah, yeah, and I definitely hesitated about putting it on my list, because, you know, the original release was in, like, 99 uh, for the PlayStation for Final Fantasy V, in terms of it coming stateside. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, but it just, I, I think it is impossible to ignore how much of, like, a legacy console that was in terms of yeah. like, well, it look it's strong enough to port over Super Nintendo games, so let's just start doing that. Oh right? yeah, and, and that that felt super original and, and like awesome at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Super Nintendo in my pocket? You kidding me? How could I not buy one? Uh, Kyle, number three. Uh, number three for me. This this was a hard list to do, by the way. After like looking at all the Game Boy Advance. Yeah, it sneaks up on you. Number three, but uh, yeah, Golden Sun for me Perfect. Was, was number three, and like. It's it's weird because like I I was not a big RPG guy like Golden Sun was really one of my first like turn based RPGs that I really got into and like I I, I it's funny I think I I actually replayed some of it recently like in the last like year and a half on Wii U and like I I was really into it again and I I was like I wanted it on like a handheld so I wanted it on Switch so badly but like the way the combat looks and moves is just so cool I like how it's very puzzle focused more so than maybe most RPGs like it's it, it, there's there's more puzzles to do and like I think it's interesting the way you're chasing the antagonists over the course of the game and like I even think about it now with like people clamoring for a new Golden Sun and I'm certainly with them but I'm like you know I don't what the thing that I'd want from Golden Sun is like just this 16 bit version like I really didn't like the DS one very much oh did you play I, that like, yeah HD 2D maybe Ooh, yeah that, yeah maybe like I would home. like that Octopath approach to yeah. that like just because that's that's when I see the the combat in like the Dragon Quest, the Octopath Dragon Quest, whatever you want to call it, I'm intrigued by it because it looks like Golden Sun with that like <laughs> tilted camera that kind of right, just moves right, right. around. Yeah, like I I just I just want a straight port to Switch. That's what I want from Golden Sun. I also the I the one last like weird relationship thing I have with Golden Sun is like I played the hell out of it. I have all these memories of playing it on like road trips and like even like school field trips and stuff like that. And uh, 
I actually never beat it because the game I had the game in my car and the my Game Boy Advance was stolen uh, from my car. So there's like some like save that's at the end boss that I was uh, that's just somewhere so probably rolled in credits the, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the like, wound. yeah, yeah. So, so someday I'll I'll get around to finally beating Golden Sun. You know. Yeah, uh, Golden Sun was definitely one of those games that. Because there were so many like SNES type games, it this one felt like it's showing off the power of the GBA with like the way the combat felt. Like not it, it felt 3D like in that you, your characters were kind of like in one side, but not like the Final Fantasy like everyone's flat. You know, like the the, yeah. the combat did not look or feel flat. It felt and like you were in a space, like yeah, truly, like a 3D space. It was cool. Yeah. And I, that actually made me think, oh, is the combat going to be different? But it's like a very traditional RPG, actually, with like putting yeah, aside some report. of the, like, like the way a lot of the boss fights relied on you knowing like specific ways to take them down. Like they were very puzzly, like you said. Yeah. And like, but especially I, when you combine like the, was it the gin system where you're like, yeah. have all those different orbs? And like, I remember that being almost overwhelming when I played it. But like, there's so many combinations. How am I supposed to ring this thing for the best I, possible system? I also had a great moment where I discovered how that system worked very late because I was not an RPG guy. So it's, it's, it was actually a really good, like, first RPG in quotes. I had yeah. played other ones, but that was the first one I really got into. And so, like, I got stuck on like a big boss. And it was during that boss fight after dying a few times that I figured out the gin system. And I was like, oh, there's ba- they're basically Final Fantasy summons, ultimately, is what it is. And it's like, it was awesome. It was awesome yeah. to, like, have that tool that I didn't even know I had in my pocket. And it just totally demolished that boss that I was stuck on for so long. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. also really fun for me because I think the, the way that I first encountered that game was that I, I actually found it in someone's car and they were at the last boss. So really? I just <laughs> finished the game and then went back through it again. It was really, oh, it was just like a fun present that I just randomly happened upon. That's and really was, cool, man. It was really That's cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all I, the best credit rolls happen. But like, I, I almost that one almost made my list too. I just didn't, honestly, I didn't put it on there because I don't, really remember like too much about it again i played all of these games when i was really young yeah but um what's crazy about that one is like it you know i mentioned Bravely default 2 is one of the few jrpgs that i actually enjoy uh golden sun actually probably would be the first one that i ever enjoyed and both me and my brother loved it as people that are also weren't heavy into like especially the more you know traditional like well basically jrpgs instead of just like you know, Western RPGs, but uh, we both loved it. And I remember it being kind of a random game that I think we just sort of, we didn't find any sales card, but just sort of picked up, you know, <laughs> this is like early, early era of us. You know, we did have like gay magazines, but we definitely weren't, you know, tastemakers, like looking at like the hottest releases. We sort of just picked up what looked cool and we both loved it so much. And like, I recommend that game to everybody, even if that's not your genre, because I think there's just something so approachable and lovable about it. Yeah, yeah. I remember I, loving I think it also goes to show just how like Nintendo's kind of trend uh, uh, away from RPGs and that this is one of the franchises that they just have completely forgotten about. And it just happens to be another one of their like, well, we like this is a traditional JRPG. And for whatever reason, Nintendo seems pretty averse to those uh, outside of like partnering with outside studios, things like, yeah. uh, you know, like with the Xenoblade Chronicles and stuff. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, that's second party. It's a monolith at this point. Yeah. I, I don't think, think, yeah, I don't, I don't know if they're Russian. owned. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's crazy that, you know, now that studio that made Golden Sun is busy making Mario Golf Super Rush. Like the, the game we were talking about earlier this episode is that Camelot's still going strong. And, you know, that's <laughs> why you like those RPG mechanics in Mario Golf, Kyle, because it goes back oh. to Golden Sun. Right. Yeah. But another th- quick thing I love about Golden Sun is, is the first game I played. I'm sure others have existed, but Isaac is the character's name, right? Who's like psychic. And like the idea of having yeah. a double whammy of talking to NPCs was so cool. Where you can talk to them in the town, and then you can do your, like your secret mind reading talk to them to see what they really think. I thought that was such a fun idea. Um, my number three, uh, just to be a bit of a snob, uh, Rhythm Tengoku, which is technically the first Rhythm Heaven game. Oh, but you didn't... hipster! Oh. That game didn't even come out in America. Oh, it didn't. I don't even know. I don't see boundaries, Kyle. Yeah, I imported <laughs> this thing after really enjoying the DS game and kind of went back in time. So it came out in 2006, which is wildly late for the Game Boy Advance. But this is yeah the origins of the Rhythm Heaven series didn't come out uh, over here, but. Kyle, you learned to love this series, I know. It's from the same studio that, you know, makes the WarriorWare games, so very much has that vibe and sensibility of just randomness, but, like, working your way through these incredibly simple rhythm games, and then it climaxes every time in a big remix where it mashes up all those mini games together, basically micro games, if you want to call them that, just for this big 
musical sequence where you're jumping between all the different mechanics. Uh, so much fun. And the music's still so good. Just today, I was just going through and listening to that soundtrack again. Uh, it's just the simplest concept, but I really, really love Rhythm Tengoku. That was, I have a, a very distinct memory of being in my college library, looking at the internet and downloading Fancy. video. Yeah, downloading a video footage of the mini game where you pull the hairs out yeah. of the onion chip. And I just remember being like, I'd never, I, I was certainly aware that games didn't come to America, but that was the first time that I was like borderline angry. I was like, I need to play this and I don't know how. This looks incredible. Like, I just, I, and it's, I never have. I think you had a copy, right? Yeah, like yeah. I, that you imported, but I've, I've, I should I should see if I should, can yeah, get one. It's a very easy one to import too because it's like there's very little English and even like the first rhythm game in there has like English lyrics to the song and stuff like it's you mm -hmm. really don't need to know any Japanese to kind of make your way through that thing. It's super fun. Yeah, I imagine I imagine by by now standards that game is probably pretty tough. So because I remember playing the like the Wii one, and I feel like that's maybe a franchise that benefits from being on a portable where yeah. the uh, the screen latency is like pretty rock solid in terms of we designed it for this screen for this latency for this timing totally uh, whereas i remember playing the one on the wii and kind of being frustrated and yep. that was when i found out that you can change tvs to game mode and they'll play better but i remember playing it with like the, the super high latency because it had like it also had like the motion smoothing and stuff on and just like being super frustrated how impossible this game was on the wii oh that and monkey going on forums thing. And like yeah oh. there, were, there was I, I remember reading a thread where they were like uh, you have like this is like the best TV to play with this game and then like well <laughs> not having the money to get that TV and just like how can I like what is a can I play it on my monitor is there a way to hook up my Wii to my my monitor and play it better that way but like I, I would be curious to see what a, a new one of those looks like on the switch totally where they have to compensate because I, I besides making the timings a lot easier and making them more loose obviously yeah yeah uh, digging through the history of the series, apparently the developer made the entire studio take dance lessons before developing the game. That was the big <laughs> the big leap. It's like, I feel like we need to understand rhythm a little bit better before we make a game all about it. And it shows. When you're plucking chin hairs out of that onion, you can feel the dance <laughs> lessons coming through. Uh, Janet, number two. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2. I feel like I have Perfect. a very basic list, but um, really? I played the hell out of this. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's like, so funny. Yeah, no, yeah, I did like it's, it's so good. I played the hell out of this in, you know, when it was out on GBA and like because it was portable, it was such a fun pick up and play experience. Um, I think it also had like that competitive angle, which is like seeing who could score the highest. I feel like the GBA was maybe the first like handheld because my me and my brother never had like the same console at once we just like shared the consoles so we didn't have like two ps2s like we just shared one and then had you know someone else had the gamecube um but that i think the gba was the first time we both got the console at the same time because otherwise we were always behind or ahead of one another like my brother had the big chonky game boy and i had the pocket like later on so it was like well we can play the same games but like i'm not carrying around this massive calculator size thing so it just it didn't really hit the same but we both had like you know semi matching ones like i had the pink one he had the blue one and you know we would play games like this together all the time so yeah i have a lot of fond memories of like playing this at my grandma's house or like she you know would take us to her job like just like cleaning salons and i'd be in the back just like racking up the points um but yeah great game and i think the more skateboarding games come out because we see stuff like you know skateboards dropping later and there's like other indies that have taken on skating and i know like um you know ali ali world is like coming out soon and all that but it's so hard to get skating down well and tony hawk pro skater too it just does it and it does it better than i think has it still has been done so i'm just chasing that high it uh, no i don't want to play the remake or the re-release oh you should uh it uh technically this game the game boy advance version won a bafta <laughs> which is one of those I mean, weird was, anomalies i believe it was a launch title right oh is that advance? right i'm not sure could have been i could be wrong about that but i mean it it really it has that isometric view, so it feels 3D. Yeah. Like, it It was the one that, like, because I, I would show to people and be like, look, did you, have you seen the new Game Boy? You got, look at this. This is impressive. And, yeah, Tony Hawk was one I sunk a lot of time into. Like, that was my first, like, really genuine Tony Hawk experience, I think. And then I went backward and got Tony Hawk 1 and, oh, and weird. really dove into 3 and 4. But I think Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 on Game Boy Advance was the one that, that was my first experience with the series. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Same. 
Uh, Serial number two? My number two is uh, Fire Emblem, the Sacred Stones. There it is, the Sacred Stones themselves. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, uh, I, I think this is a pretty good intro to Fire Emblem, actually, because it was like, it had the thing that I think a lot of Fire Emblem fans hate in that you could, uh, you so you basically follow this map of like encounters and stuff, but you could go back and repeat encounters, which is, uh, I think at the time was kind of like a big no-no for Fire Emblem people because the, like the last game even was like, you have the this set of encounters, you have like th this many kind of attempts to, get your party leveled up properly and, and in like managing okay i need to have this guy but this guy's under leveled so i need to have him fight these guys without dying so i need to like corral but like in this one you could just go back to this one arena fight and just like level everybody up completely and break the game completely but right. i think that's what makes it a really good intro to fire emblem in that you can just kind of um basically work around the difficulty by grinding uh which is what i did and it was a, a really cool kind of experience and being introduced to fire emblem that way of just like this was still around the time when you were like oh you could just find games at a kiosk and see them and like think oh this is really cool and at the time it was like how good the 2d animation for the battles were at the time like you like you know like the horses would run really smoothly like the um, all the critical attacks look cool like if you if you if you play smash brothers ike's up oh. b is is the uh critical attack for the hero in Fire Emblem, where he like throws the sword up, catches it, and slashes down. Do you think that's and why you were interested in Fire Emblem? I thought it was just looking cool at a kiosk. Was because you like Marth and Ike? Well, from, I mean, yeah, I've always been meaning Boys to play. Like, yeah, because you would hear right. about uh, Marth and, and Roy being from this like obscure Japanese series named Fire Emblem, which at the time was like, what is that? That's like, you know, like that game's not yeah, in wait, America. Hey, real quick, cares? a sidestep here, Serial. What, what is the timeline here? Because like, I know Fire Emblem was on NES, but not America, right? And then when right. they were in Melee, that was kind of a weird thing because they were characters Americans were not familiar with. And then Fire yeah. Emblem's introduction to America was Game Boy Advance, right? That was the yeah. first one. It was, then, it was, this is the this is the second one though, right? Yeah, the this is the second one. So I didn't I okay. didn't play that first one until after I beat the the. So I think the the original Fire Emblem for GBA was 2003. So it was like I think two years after Melee, yeah. which was weird because uh, I, they actually had released the Fire Emblem. So like Marth was the, like the original character, and Roy at the time I believe was the most recent hero, because like they had released uh, a GBA game that starred Roy. And I think in the 2003 Fire Emblem, which is the game right after that, I think I think it's either his son or his father, Elridge, that you play as. Uh, so it was weird because like I wanted to play the one where you were Roy because he was my favorite of the two Fire Emblem characters. But like we literally just missed it and they never translated or ported it <laughs> over for some reason, which you would think they would do because yeah. of the popularity of Smash Brothers. But, but no, they just they released the one with his with its relative and I didn't play that one. But Sacred Stones, I think, was really cool. And like you just see stuff like the critical for the Blade Master just made it look super cool. And I think how much I love the, those games and specifically those animations, I think, has kind of tempered my love for the series since then because ever since they've done it in 3d they just have the battle animations just don't look that good mm. uh like there, there has been no 3d version of that animation that i think has like done as much for me as those 2d sprites which is like kind of a hard thing to weigh against it because it's just like if you saw those now it's like oh that's quaint but like what they're doing in in three houses is like obviously so much more technically impressive but it's like i'll, I'll always have um a soft spot for those animations on on GBA for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kyle number two. Yeah, so I I say this with very little confidence. My one and two, I'm not sure if I have them wrong. And maybe tomorrow I'll feel differently. But my number two is, is going to be Minish Cap, Ooh. Uh, Legend of Zelda Minish Cap, which hmm. I actually played on my DS. Like just to kind of give you an idea of like when it released. I like the Game Boy Advance was was done at that point. I think right, and so like that's I played it on my DS, but it was weird because like I didn't have much anticipation for it. But then like the day it came out and I started playing it, I was like, oh right, I have a new like 2D Zelda game, like a brand new 2D Zelda game, and this is fantastic. And like it's so good. I love the the shrinking mechanic of like going underground. I love the art. I love the way it looks. I love the um the various upgrades you can get that like change how you move through the world. Like you can you roll using the right trigger and stuff like that. To the point where like in my I don't really know what my Zelda ranking is but Minish Cap is like very high really? like maybe top 
five. You know what I mean? Like Ocarina, Majora's Breath of the Wild, and then like maybe Twilight Princess and like Minish. Just like I, I haven't really thought about it too much, but it's like I they really love Zelda. Minish Cap a lot. Yeah, I they'd almost made my list. It was like kind of like the one that was hovering around the the periphery, mostly because I don't remember a ton of it. I remember the the shrinking stuff. I remember the 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 mitts. I remember you had mitts you could dig with, and I yeah, remember dig, yeah. the side quest where you had to find like the other half of a bunch of coins because like the picorial had these little like things that you could collect or whatever. But I the do King remember Stones, yeah. it, it was an interesting game for uh, interesting time for that game because we like you know link to the past was obviously like a retro game but like all that i all that i really knew was like the oracle games and uh the, the 3d zeldas um which were all like pretty big adventures like all the 3d zeldas were like really long really long games but like this felt like a really nice refresher or like a palate cleanser because it it's pretty short so you were getting like upgrades every like hour or two it, uh, it, it felt really brisk by that by comparison where it's like oh i already have another upgrade like i just i just got the boomerang i don't know like you're and you're giving me this other thing and it felt really manageable like compared to the 3d zeldas we were getting at the time because we weren't really getting a lot of 2d zeldas around that time yeah yeah just the art is so detailed just being able to go shrink down and see close-ups of like the wood and the grain and like the leaves and the light streaming through the leaves it was, it's just beautiful yeah Great choice, great choice. Uh, my number two is uh, predictable uh, for anybody that's been listening to me talk for way too long. Um, it's a game that after all these years of loving, I still can't pronounce. Karu, Karu, Kururin. Uh, the Game Boy Advance game God, developed by Aiding. such hipster choices. Oh man, it's such a hipster move. This is the game that's like Irritating Stick for PlayStation 1, but not Irritating Stick for PlayStation 1. But it, it, how it works, Jan, do you know this game? Have you ever seen these, Karu, mm-hmm. Karu? You, you play a bird who flies around in a UFO in. and the UFO <laughs> is there you go. One, you don't have to explain stop selling okay. you've already okay but get, just get a load of this it. though but it's also the UFO is a giant baton that apparently is propelled by slowly spinning and so you have to navigate this spinning baton through mazes basically uh, and get to the end goal and they have it should like, be on play date Honestly, ooh, a new crew crew and play. Now we're talking. Uh, but yeah, you can make uh, wacky clown noises and horns and a bunch of nonsense. You can speed up a little bit, but it's like this weird genre of kind of twitch puzzle is how I would describe it. Uh, but absolutely delightful. They ended up making a couple sequels, but they never really caught on in a huge way. I think that GameCube version was just in Japan. Um, but they released Karu Karu, the first one, on Wii U. So if you have your Wii U out and you're you've been playing I Metroid do. Fusion or whatever on there, like it's worth checking out Karu Karu if you've never played it because like the challenge mode in particular is yeah. uh, a hell of a lot of fun. And there's still like homages to it that are still released now. Like a couple years ago, Roundabout, that funny game from No Goblin where you're spinning taxi or spinning limo. I'm sorry, that was based on this. And then earlier this year, a game called Spinny's Journey released, which is also a big Karu Karu homage. So it exists. Yeah. Real quick, what does a funny clown noise sound like? Mm. Um, I guess it's kind of like just a horn, like a. Uh-huh. Okay. You know, that's that, pretty good. Thanks. Signataro here today. <laughs> <laughs> Deep cuts. Uh, Janet, number one, no doubt about it. You're number one. That's Metro Fusion because <laughs> it has to be. Has to be. Um, yeah, I, it was between that and like you know, it was again on that poor train Super Mario Advance Four, which is Brothers Three. Which I think either is a fine one to have on there. But for me, like that was my entry point into like the Metroid series. And it was just such a like a badass game. And I'm obsessed with the suit design and just every everything about it. Um, And it it, yeah, that's that is my point of Metroid that I adore, especially as someone that wasn't again with my thing with Prime, even though I've since like gone back and and putzed around in there. But it being first person just really disoriented me as someone used to playing 2D stuff. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I feel like I it just hit. It hit all the levels because the story was intriguing. The gameplay was intriguing. Um, I know y'all just did that um, spoiler cast, right, on Metro Fusion? That happened? Did I, dr- I didn't dream that? Well, right? you did dream it no. for the let people listening because it's going to be going up Friday on Min Max's YouTube channel. But yeah, Serial and Kyle both recently replayed it and had a big old Max spoilers about it. So it'll also be up on the Patreon exclusive podcast feed if you want to lock it there. But stay tuned for Friday's big discussion. Yeah, and can confirm for you, Janet, it holds up. Still a lot of fun. Real good game. It's pretty short too, right? Yeah, uh, it it is it is really short. Like it it is like uh, uh, Minish Cap in that it just feels like you are just clipping through upgrades and, and like 
missile missile expansions all the time and you know we talked about it a little bit but it feels like again like a good starter metroid because it, it is not as open-ended as other metroid games and you're just constantly being funneled to like uh the the serotonin drips of the, like oh like if, if you if you get the inkling that there's a hit the secret hidden here basically anytime you hit a dead end like just p- power bomb everything and like find the upgrade and it just and like the main story is so guided that it feels like okay i'm not trying to figure out where to go uh and i'm finding these upgrades along the way versus like okay i know exactly where i need to go but i'm do- i'm still doing the exploration stuff on the side so it feels like a, a good way to get you to think about how to explore metroid spaces uh, which oh, it, like is really cool. That, that that was the other game that was on my periphery, but I almost cheated by saying like someone will bring it up. I'll talk. About it. <laughs> exactly right. That that's absolutely going to be me. And I I think I liked it too because it did have that balance that you're talking about where. You know, I'm, I'm sure it was still challenging its own and right, but not nearly as like I tried going back to like the or, like the starting point of Metroid, and yeah. I found it like just a little bit more laborious, right? Like it's a little bit slower. It's a, it's a, just a little bit more difficult to figure out oh, yeah. naturally, which I think a lot of games in that era were. That just kind of was how games were made back then. So I really liked it for that reason, too. Like, I think it's it, like you said, it's a great starting point for people. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, so expect a lot more discussion about that coming up soon on the YouTube channel and the Patreon exclusive podcast feed. Thanks for your support. Uh, sorry, all number two or sorry, number one. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm going to do the hipster move here and say uh, Advance Wars. What? Uh, you yeah, hipster. This obscure 2001 game. Uh, no, like that, that, I remember, I have a very specific memory of like my oldest brother uh, was in the Navy. And so he would, he would, you know, he would be deployed for long periods of time. And this was one of the first things he kind of brought back was like, I just remember like we, we all, he came back for like, cause we were all going on a family trip to go back to Mexico for a little while. And I just like, okay, it's like cool getting to see my brother. I haven't seen him in a long time. But then at one point I found uh, him playing like this, this game on the, on the Game Boy called Advance Wars. It's like, what is that? Oh, it's like a game where you're kind of like uh, the army or whatever. And you're trying to like kill other people in the army. And it's like, okay, that cause he was a lot, he was like a, a big, like war game guy. He was like, he played okay. a lot of Starcraft. He liked, he, he liked Age of Empires. He like, he would play like random, like civil war sim games, like Getty, like Anthenum and like Gettysburg games. And Do stuff you think like that, that like partly fueled him to join the Navy then? It's like, well, I've grown up loving war yeah, games. I, I, he, he, like he was obsessed with war stuff. Like he, he would watch like documentaries on, on this, on like the civil war and world war two all the time when he was like our age, like when he was like huh. a teenager. Um, and so like, this was another one of those war games. And like most of my time, most of the time I was like, okay, that's, that's his like, uh, like, boring war thing but the, like this game was like colorful it was like really explosive and then it's like oh nintendo made this and i was like oh nintendo this is a nintendo game and so yeah i just like i i poured like a bunch of time into that instead of doing anything on that vacation uh and like <laughs> since then it's That's like the best been, vacation <laughs> oh yeah uh it, where yeah I, I just found it really 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 like powerful and i, I liked a lot of the music and like characters were really cool i liked all the units and stuff and then like just going back to it a couple times th- um it it feels so immaculately balanced in that everything it feels like as close to chess as anything else where it's just like okay this has this answer and this is this maneuver you can pull off uh specific maneuvers to like corral people into this and it's like oh this thing this thing that happened like two turns ago that was when you lost not when you moved in here like they they, they just set up something that just means you're going to lose two turns later in a way that felt very manageable because it wasn't it didn't have rpg hooks it didn't have a, a upgrade stuff where it's just like if you knew how to play this game you can play it better than other people and it felt weird because it it was turn-based starcraft basically where it's just like you start off with resources you have to go and expand and you're building this army and you're kind of building it based around what your opponent is building using counters and stuff and so it felt like okay i i am playing kind of a multiplayer game against a single uh, against an ai but that ai is smart enough to feel like an ai opponent or to feel like a real opponent yeah, uh, and you can see Serial playing the first two hours of Advanced Wars on Minmex's YouTube channel if you want, because he streamed that a little while ago from Minmex Plays, where we we stream every Tuesday and Thursday on Twitch, and that was a Serial's choice, so you can check out yeah, the big old and, archive. Yeah, and one thing, I, I I went back to it, and like I think one thing that that game does is it's really dense with the rules and stuff of like, okay, the APCs, you may not, like, they don't do any damage, but they're really good for refueling people and for carrying troops across the battlefield, right? And that's, the, like, it has a Final Fantasy Tactics-esque, like, okay, here's a bunch of things you need to know before you even start playing this game. But one of the things it does is it, like, the, the tutorial is part of the story, um, 
in that like this whole mission where we're going to teach you about APCs, like here's this character arc with like Olaf, the commander of the Blue Moon Army, like having formerly been of the Orange Star and Nell is like, okay, yeah, he we and I used he and I used to like uh, be pals on a lot of missions. So they're, they they seed in that intrigue of like, oh, what's happening with these characters and make the tutorial more fun to play. More so than I, I went back to Final Fantasy Tactics as a tutorial and that thing is way too dense. Like I cannot penetrate it. It is really tough. Yeah. Um, but I think that is, a, that is, it is like the best case for why a tutorial can help a ton. Yeah. Uh, and that remake's coming out December 3rd on Switch right. for, for yeah. the first two. Uh, Kyle, number one, don't fail me, dude. Uh, WarioWare. Yes, WarioWare correct. Number one, which is like, I, like I love Minish Cap. It's like a fantastic Zelda game. But I was like, in terms of thinking about just like something that just felt wholly unique and continues to feel wholly unique, and just really just eight Game Boy Advance batteries away from me. Like WarioWare was like was it, man? There's like nothing like it. It was so weird and cool and fun, and I replayed it so much. I tried to unlock like everything in that game. Um, I played a little bit of it recently with the announcement. Like, I broke out the 3DS, which led me to play Metroid Fusion and stuff. Yeah. And, like, it's just still so fun to just, like, play a bunch of micro games. It's it's so smart and silly in, like, in that sort of way that Nintendo it doesn't do enough, I feel like. It, like, they, they need to be weirder. And, like, WarioWare <laughs> is, like, the place where they got to be just weird as hell. And I, I love it for that. Yeah, I, I'm also with you. I completely love it. Yeah, I found an old quote uh, where Sakamoto, apparently a designer on the game, he said that Wario was chosen as the game's protagonist as he is, quote, always doing something stupid and really idiotic. Like, yeah, that sums yeah. it up. That sums up a lot of that game because it's really that's stupid and really idiotic. <laughs> that's exactly that's, it. That's but just a lot of Wario wear. Delightfully yeah. dumb. Um, yeah. And we all know, Kyle, the greatest micro game is... Finger up the nose. Finger up the nose, yeah. I was going to go with the <laughs> pulling Wario's shirt down with his big fat belly and you have to like <laughs> push against it. It's so good. Yeah, I'm it, enjoying watching Janet's facial expression <laughs> as somebody who's not super familiar with Wario. Who hasn't like, been awakened to her new life about? yet. Like, this is not the first time. I'm like, it's like when I would teach and like my students would tell me a story. I'm like, yeah, okay. All right, sure. <laughs> yeah. It's like when yeah, my kid tells weekend. me about Roblox now. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is like a game almost, like it feels weird because it, I, I almost want to say it's like, it tests your ability as a gamer to like quickly pick up gameplay concepts of yep. like, just based on how this screen looks, what do you think is going to happen? Right. But I think it actually also makes it really, uh, inter if you have like a baseline level of how a game controller works, I think you have a pretty good understanding of like, you have, a, you'll have a good time with WarioWare because it is just like, what is the most basic game concept we can put into five seconds, right? Yeah. So it almost feels like game, like a game jam improv kind of thing. And it feels like Wario was like, well, we have all these ideas for whatever. Let's just throw them all into one thing and have, you know, kind of loosely theme it with Wario being, you know, like this with a, like a basically like a reboot for that character. It, like it, it gave, they didn't it, it feels weird to have Wario characters become the mascot of this franchise. But it feels like he was like a, a safe enough pick where they could like, OK, you, you, you remember Wario from Mario stuff, right? Like here's a we are tying him to this almost like abstract concept of game design that we're just going to like it feels like you know, like obviously Hanson, a lot of your picks are like kind of like the weird Nintendo games, what? but it feels like the, the <laughs> nice kind of, uh, coming together of like, here is a weird concept, uh, but that we made it just marketable enough to, to have it appeal to like, Oh, okay. This is how good weird Nintendo can be. This is yeah. like the kind of like the, the best version of Nintendo kind of swinging wild and actually like connecting with people and i guess they reused a lot of assets from your beloved warrior land 4 janet for cobbling this thing together and <laughs> in this old interview i found uh they said quote actually to tell you the truth we made the game secretly we we're talking about the idea of the game with some other people on the team and then we decided to just make it without telling our manager at the time which is like that's kind of like how Link's awakening started as well like i love just these secret little passion projects within nintendo and handheld was such a good spot for like let's just make the weirdest freaking thing and not tell anybody yeah, I, I I I hope that's still happening. You know, it's, right. I'm sure it's not happening as much these days. But yeah, I love those those war stories from like with Tezuka. It's like yeah, we were kind of working on a Game Boy Zelda after hours, and then we just decided to turn it into a full game and actually went into production. You know, like I love that kind of stuff. Whoops, it's, it's in it's production. Probably just now. so much harder now with the I, way tech works. You know. Yeah, 
I could see stuff like Box Boy, maybe the Pushbow yep. games being yeah. having started that way. Yeah, but a lot of HAL stuff like, still. Well, yeah, it's not like you're going to make a full 3D game just like quietly without anyone noticing. <laughs> During lunch, just casually. Yeah, you're right. Don't yeah. walk over here, Miyamoto. Oh, don't yeah, walk we, over we, here. We, here's Metro Prime 4. We made it but without telling you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if you've ever looked this up, Kyle, but it's if you're a fan of WarioWare, you should absolutely look up uh, that apparently the entire game was inspired by a mode in a game for the N64 DD in Japan. And the game is called Mario Artist Polygon Studio, where you're like modeling characters, but they had a side mode in there that was called Sound Bomber. And that's like where a lot of the team got their start. And go back and just look up Sound Bomber gameplay for Mario Artist. It is 100% WarioWare. Like it is wild. They have the same speed, same style micro games. It's fun to see like early versions of other micro games in there. I thought it'd be kind of like a loose inspiration, but you look at it, it's like this just looks like another secret WarioWare game. It's pretty cool. That's um, why, yeah, I looked it up. Yeah, but clearly, yeah, correct choice, Kyle. Uh, that's my number one as well. Uh, but there's so many other good ones. Like, <clears throat> like you mentioned, Kyle, it really sneaks up on you. Like when I started going through the list of Game Boy Advance games, like, oh, that's right. I like all of these games. There's so many good ones that I played in some way or another. Uh, shout out to the Pokemon games. Obviously, like Fire Red and Leaf Green are awesome. Ruby and Sapphire, I like a decent amount, uh, but those remakes, <laughs> yeah, I was it, definitely it, I, I think it, it kind of speaks to that time in, in Pokemon where it felt like it dipped a little bit. I I don't think Ruby and Sapphire was as well received as like the previous two iterations. Yeah. I think people really latched on to Fire Red and Leaf Green as and, like, oh, well, they're bringing it back. Like after kind of like them deviating on a, enough from the series to like kind of not have a lot of people, a lot of Pokemon fans. Well, there's, their back. there's clearly too much water in those. Um, and the big thing. Metroid Zero Missions, another good Ooh, shout out one. Yeah, 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 shout out for sure. I mean, do we all like Zero Mission? How would you compare it to Fusion? Is just kind of a slightly lesser version of Fusion? N- no, I would. I, now, this is me speaking from having played Fusion like last week and having played Zero Mission when it came out. But yeah. like, I think they're on par. Like, Zero Mission doesn't feel uh, hampered at all by being a remake. Like, it okay. feels like a proper metroid game you know yeah okay i I think it it, it, zero mission is definitely one of the better efforts when it comes to like like i think recently a lot of remakes have kind of stirred conversation about like well like a a lot of times they're meant to replace the original but they don't capture what made the original like they're they're very different beasts and like oh i would like to have the original version and the set and like the the new update but i think Zero Mission, I think, is up there with, like, the RE remake for remakes that make a case for, like, how going back through and, like, kind of doing another draft for the game can actually make it a ton better and, like, not lose a lot of what it, uh, of what makes the original, like, really, really good. Yeah. Uh, Shout out to Mega Man Battle Network. I know that... I think it's easy to poo-poo that series because they made so many of them. What, they made six? And then Star Force, they started a whole new series. It's still a basic continuation of that gameplay, but, like... I only played that first game. Maybe I started the second one, but I really, really loved it. Like, it was so weird. It was my first kind of deck building game, if you can even call it that. Chip building game. I don't know. Serial, you seem like a fan of that. Did you play that one? I actually never played it because oh, really? I, I was one of those idiots who was like, oh, this series isn't like the Mega Man that I like. Uh, it's like, this isn't Mega Man. Uh, but I definitely feel like that's one of the series where I think if I played it, I would probably love it. But it, instead, I was playing the other Mega Man series on GBA, Mega Man Zero, mm. uh, which which I really liked. That was another game that almost made it into my top ten uh, or my top three because like that that felt like okay, they're they're going they're swinging very dark in terms of like what this game is doing to the timeline, where it's like a hundred years after Mega Man X, X is dead. Uh, like that's the starting point of this game and you're like zero who's lost his amnesia and like the world has ended by the way it's like it's all just reploids now because all the humans are dead reploids uh yeah so uh it, it, it was a really cool like burst of like classic main man action also like stupidly hard that that first one especially yeah it's tough. uh janet do you have other honorable mentions yeah, I played a lot of the Castlevania games on GBA. Yeah. So just yeah. kind of that series in general. Like, I spent a lot of time with those, just slowly going up the stairs painfully. <laughs> yeah, Aria of Sorrow is, like, I, as, you know, up there with any other Castlevania game for me. Like, you know, I, I'll put it aside Symphony of the Night any day, you know? Yeah, I I have not played Aria of Sorrow, but I did, I did, I do have a cartridge of it. I have, I don't know if it's real, because I got it for eight dollars, <laughs> and like right now, a lot of those classic games are going for pretty exp- for pretty high prices. But I do want to play that game because I think my my starting point for Castlevania was like the the DS games. But uh, hearing like oh, Aria is probably the best one if you were going to play one of those GBA games. Um, but yeah, like those those it was a 
surprisingly strong era for that series on the GBA. Yeah, and there was what, like a leak of a rating for Castlevania Game Boy Advance collection or something like the Castlevania, Castlevania Advance. Advance collection, yeah. Which, okay. I, which would be the three, Circle of the Moon, Harmony of Dissonance, and Ari of Sorrow. Gotcha. Uh, which, like, that would be super cool. Just that, uh, like, the idea of here's, like, just three straight ports sounds weird now in 2021 where it's like, oh, no, we have to up the thing and, like, change the fonts or whatever. It's like, <laughs> if this is just, like, literally putting these three games, selling it for $60, I think people would lose it over it if it's oh, yeah. because of how many yeah. other ports are like uh we've decided to actually screw around with it in this way that is going to piss everybody off for, <laughs> don't for say that don't like, say that yeah even, even, as much as kind of bare bones as like the 3d mario all-stars collection was in retrospect it feels like well at least the games are on the console the way we remember them <laughs> yeah, that's until now they're not because they don't sell it anymore yeah that's, yeah, that's a great so point yeah, that's yeah. weird yeah it's like even in what could be, and this is not to discount the work that actually takes to port something, because that is a lot of work, but it's like, all right, we're not going to really do anything to these. We're just going to give them to you, but not for long. Why? Why? <laughs> I'd argue it's the what, dumbest it's, thing of 2020. What monkey's paw? What weird the Nintendo <laughs> cat that just picks out next projects? I don't understand. It's still infuriating, yeah. Uh, shout out to a game that I learned later did not review very well, uh, but I really loved, and I think a lot of people bought it, but Legacy of Goku, that entire series, like, pretty mindless uh, stuff, uh, but in terms of just, like, a fun action RPG, I think I played all three of those uh, and really love those super simple games where it's, like, breaking it up. Like, the first one, you just work your way up through Namek, I guess, and then it, it breaks up beyond that. But I yeah. assume, did you guys play those two, Legacy of Goku? I played those. Not much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I feel like I missed the boat on those because I I think I had that it had that reputation for me where I was like oh these just seem cheap I think but well, they're I think cheap I would yeah have loved them, but you if know? you like you know using Kamehameha on wolves to slowly watch an experience bar go up and leveling up like this is the game for you baby it is a lot of taking down wolves as Goku and they have a yeah, really it's cool yeah it has a really weird story I think I remember talking to you about it Kyle years ago where I was trying to dig into it, but it's developed by Webfoot Technologies, which is a studio down in Chicago, Janet. Hey. Hey, Webfoot. Webfoot. Um, and so <laughs> they have a really strange thing where they develop these three Legacy of Goku games and they still exist as far as I can tell. And for the last like seven years, they've been teasing on Facebook, like maybe we'll make Legacy of Goku 4. Look at this. And they're like uploading all of this art to be like, is this Legacy of Goku 4? Do you guys want it? And then in the comments, they just start saying like, seriously, we need funding. We're going to go Indiegogo. We're going to go Kickstarter. We're going to develop Legacy of Goku 4. It's like, what are you people doing? And then I kept reading these comments from years ago on Facebook because I'm a dork. And they said that, uh, quote, we developed Legacy of Goku 1 as an indie game without any funding. And they didn't give us a contract for Dragon Ball Z until the game was almost finished. And so I feel like they're still trying to do that with this mystical legacy of Goku 4 and just trying to tease yeah. and rile up fans enough, hoping that Bandai Namco will give them the rights to make this thing. Uh, it's my favorite weird saga in the game industry. Yeah, and uh, I, I also really like the Sonic Advance games. Uh, w w that was like my first kind of big exposure to 2D Sonic. I played like the Sonic Adventure games. But like this was this felt like a really cool like, OK, we're going to we're going to try to amp up the gameplay a little bit more by introducing a few more like kind of upgrade concepts. But like I remember those games looking really cool and being like a really early showcase of um, like what the Game Boy Advance could do in terms of like speed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were just called Sonic Advance. Is that the Sonic Advance? Yeah. OK. Was that where the was that where the bat was? No, was that, was, that was in Ad Bat Adventure 2. That was, I think. <sighs> Was that where Cream the Rabbit was introduced? Oh, okay. That right, actually. I'm thinking, yeah. thinking of the DS one that I played where they introduced some other character. But I remember those were, were also beloved. Mm. Um, believe it or not, old Sonic game was beloved. Um, also, quick <laughs> shout out in the uh, obscure column. There's a game called Eggmania that I spent a lot of time with, which is like a Tetris, except you play as an egg and you have to like jump around and catch the blocks and place them when you're trying to like build secure enough of a stack in a race to be the first to the top. Uh, and it's from developer Hot Gen, as everybody recalls. But shout out to Eggmania, yeah. one of the greatest. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I throw out a couple? Yeah. So, all right, so my number four probably would have been Drill Dozer, which is Game Freak's best non-Pokemon game. Right, uh, right. It's a fantastic game. 
Um, then probably Mario and Luigi. Yeah, uh, fantastic Oof. game. Yep. Uh, another like not a big RPG guy at the time, but then like really loved it because it's so active. Uh, I played Boktai for the first time, like within the last two or three years, right. which is just a weird Kojima. You got to put the game in sunlight to play it, which is very strange. Yeah. Janet, do you remember this game? No, this because that would be a very confusing pitch. He's not joking. This was Kojima produced this game for the Game Boy Advance where you needed to play it in the sunlight because it had, it had a, a sensor. sensor on the cartridge and you had to go outside to charge up your gun. Uh, <laughs> and I, I streamed it like uh, in tw- like early 2019 and I actually used a light like I had like a, a my wife came up with this idea of like me using a white that you uh, a light that you would use to cure resin and i would put that over the sensor to let me charge up my gun because i was insane. playing it on a gamecube it's yeah. in, it's nuts it's it's a kojima how game how long did the charge last a decent amount of time yeah it, 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 and i think like you couldn't beat the bosses without sunlight but you could play most of the game without sunlight yeah. it would just be like harder that's you know. so odd but i i didn't Very really good. like take anything by it because there's been so many especially with like handhelds like whenever it's a handheld, people are like, "Because we can, it's time to turn it upside down." I'm like, "Why are we doing this? Why are we, we're closing it?" It's like people every now and then turn um, games on a handheld into a game of bop it. Where you're yes, just doing yeah, sure. random Absolutely. actions Why are you just to be really it? immersed. Like, okay, that's wild. Uh, yeah. Obviously, there were the like the famous Majesco uh, game carts that were just episodes of Nickelodeon TV shows that everybody loved. And like Pokemon, Ooh, yeah. and like that saved Majesco. Like that was like a huge moneymaker yeah. was, hey, we're just going to put Pokemon episodes on the Game Boy Advance. Because honestly, I remember being in Target as a kid and seeing those and being like, it would be kind of cool to have a mobile version you know, of the Pokemon episodes. I'm going to throw, because it's I won't be on questions this week, I'll, I'll see if I can find it real quick. But yeah. there was a, a, a get a load of this that I've had pocketed for a while. Uh, Hanson, is hey. that hey? Get a load of this. Someone oh, put the whoa, movie. Whoa, 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 Kyle, Kyle, yeah, please. I just wanted to say, I think it is time for a little premature. Get a load of this. Do, do okay, y- yes, now? Kyle. Uh, yeah. So someone, uh, yeah, we were talking about those Game Boy Advance cartridges with episodes of TV shows. Someone put the entirety of the movie Tenet on like a bunch of Game Boy Advance cartridges. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm gonna go ahead. Well, can you throw that in the get a load of this links? Yeah, just to, yeah, we'll put it in there. Since it's so it's like pertinent. insert many cartridge two. Yeah. Well, let's see. It looks like they have five Ooh, pictured. Hold on. I can't see. hear anything for some reason. Sorry. Uh-oh. Uh oh. Yeah, maybe five. Uh, well, that sounds great. That might be the best way to watch the movie Tenet. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. I think yeah. So. You yeah. have to watch it backwards though. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, Serial, do you know how this whole thing operates? Uh, I take a big swig of. Patreon. That's right. Patreon.com slash minmax with two ends, everybody. We exist because of wonderful people going out of their way, typing in that URL saying, hmm, which of these benefits do I want to benefit myself with? And then that's the reason these shows exist. So thank you, everybody. Uh, And a special thanks to everybody who supports us at a bigger tier like the Best of the Rest podcast. Each week on Best of the Rest, we take a second look at superhero movie that was poorly received upon release and only talk about what the movie does well. It's sometimes a challenge, but always a good time. Best of the Rest is hosted by community member Chris Logan along with friend and comic book expert Andrew Williams. Together, they aim to create fun, positive, and entertaining discussion on movies that the internet usually tears apart. Jump right into the latest episode on X-Men Origins Wolverine. Woof. Or check out the past episode on Spider-Man 3 and be sure to subscribe to hear future episodes like Catwoman. It's available wherever you get your podcast. It's the best of the rest. Thank you, Chris Logan, and best of the rest for supporting us throughout the month. We appreciate it. Uh, also, thanks to Fixture Gaming. They want everybody to know about the Fixture S1, which is a clip that you clip onto your Switch Pro controller so you're able to slide the actual Switch screen into the dock thing, and you can actually play on the go with the Switch Pro controller. I know I say this a lot, but just look up a picture of the Fixture S1 and it'll immediately snap and you'll say, ah, yes, that is what I would like to hold my hand. That is the best way to play Switch on the go. So I can keep using my Switch Sweet Pro Controller. Uh, you can get it in gray, you can get it red or blue, and you can get it for 35 bucks on their site or on Amazon. But if you use their site, you can use the promo code MINMAX. Two ends in MinMax uh, for $5 off the Fixture S1. So if you like playing on the go in style, check out Fixture Gaming's Fixture S1. Also, thank you to the Call Me By Your Game podcast. Isn't that right, Mr. Hilliard? 
Yeah, you know, Hanson, there's mm. at least one video game that's close to your heart from an impactful, specific moment in your life. Call Me By Your Game is a podcast that dives into these very experiences. It's an intimate look at what makes video games special for different people. On each episode, the host Connor McCabe sits down with a guest to discuss a special game from their past. They dive into what the guest loved about the game and also what was memorable about the time in their life when they first fell in love with it. Check us out, or excuse me, check them out. Check out the Call Me By Your Game podcast, wherever you get your podcasts, and maybe someday you'll call me by your game. That's very And I sweet. believe you have a note here for me, Hanson, that a recent episode covered Majora's Mask. The last that episode was all here? about Majora's Mask, which I know Great is game. your cup of tea, so you can't ignore it. Thanks for uh, the support. Call Me By Your Game podcast. We appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who subscribes to these you know, community podcasts and shows them some love. It doesn't take a lot to subscribe or leave a review, but it can really change their mood, change their day. So thanks, everybody, for supporting on both ways there. Also, thanks to our dear friends at I Am 8-Bit. They want everybody to know that you can get the Sea of Thieves triple album right now on I Am 8-Bit's wonderful online store. This is a tropical island colored vinyl with pop-up papercraft center labels, music by Robin Beanland. It looks fantastic. And if you go to I Am 8-Bit's wonderful online store, you can use the promo code Bottle Rocket. Bottle Rocket all throughout the month of July. So Bottle Rocket, all one word, for 10% off everything in I'm Ape, it's online store under $100. They are unbelievably generous with us, so we'd appreciate it if you went over there, use the promo code Bottle Rocket, one word, and checked out what I'm Ape, it has in their store because they're fantastic. And they're so generous that they ship out a wonderful prize every single week to a member of the community who submits a great question over on Patreon. Uh, this week, they're shipping out a PlayStation 5 physical game, The Pathless, Kyle which the physical oh. version is an I Am 8-Bit exclusive. And Kyle, this is one of your favorite games of last year, yes? Love that game. And I've been thinking of revisiting it, maybe trying to get that platinum. Nice, yeah. It's really good. They're shipping it out out of the kindness of their hearts, so please help support I Am 8-Bit. And we need to keep track of the best question of the week because they will win this wonderful online prize. Are you all ready to go for some good community questions? Well, not me, but... Yeah. Oh, wh Why? Because you, you said I could clap out. That's okay, amazing. well, thanks for joining us, Kai. We'll see you next time. <sighs> Hi, Leo Vader. Hi. You're welcome to the show whenever you want. If it's, like, late at night and you can't sleep, you can just clap once and you'll be right here, buddy. You say you that, but I was on? sitting here clapping for the past hour. <laughs> oh, crap, I didn't think you'd take me up on it. Anyways, Leo, we have a bunch of community questions uh, that we need your help. Uh, answering like no one can do this better than you is what we promise people so don't disappoint okay great okay great Steven Lamson writes in and says speaking of the greatest Game Boy Advance games of all time uh, Leo we've been talking about the Game Boy Advance for like six hours now um, I purchased my Game Boy Advance on release and was super excited to dive in and play my mom stopped at Taco Bell for lunch and on the ride home my younger brother dropped his lava hot nacho cheese all over my brand new white Game Boy Advance <laughs> I stared in horror as liquid cheese penetrated every opening of the little device I was able to open the Game Boy Advance and give it a good cleaning but every time I played on the device I had a craving for nachos do any of you have a handheld horror story I bought a Game Boy Advance SP from a friend and not I like bought it because my family and I were going on a trip and I took it on the plane in a Ziploc bag and something about the air pressure just shattered the screen <laughs> like totaled it immediately <laughs> what you think this would be a common thing if every Game Boy on a plane was exploding exactly maybe it was the fact it was in a bag maybe that had something to do with it weird was the bag Airtime? like inflating as well then is there something weird with the air pressure there i don't know oh that's devastating hmm. did you try and get your money back <laughs> no <laughs> oh that's rough does anybody else have a story of their precious thing I, going away i had at one point a a red DS, I think it was for Mario Kart, where it had like a red top and a silver bottom. So it was pretty distinct. It had like, I, they, it came with like stickers and stuff that you can make it look like a race car or whatever. Badass. Uh, so I put stickers on it. Very cool. It cool. Uh, and at one point I lost it. It was like, it was a thing. Uh, I just could not, I, I, it had a copy of like 
Lunar Dragon Song, which was like the DS Lunar game, which oh, was yeah. great, but that was the game I was playing at the time. And I just could not find it, spent weeks looking for it. And then a, like maybe like six months after that, I go to a friend's house and it just happens to be there with a different game in it. And like it, it was it was it had my ga- my I think I don't remember what GBA game it had, but it, it was my GBA game and someone it, it was like a some other DS game that I don't remember, but it was at a friend's house. My God. And I just could not like confront him as directly as I wanted to, but I knew it was my DS because it had the fucking stickers oh, on it. Oh, uh, dirty so dog. I, I, so I basically said, hey, what's uh, what's my DS doing here? It's weird that it turned up here. Uh, and he was like, oh yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know what it's doing there in the middle of my kitchen <laughs> counter, just randomly there with the, the game resumed there. Uh, <laughs> and so at some point I just like, okay, well it's mine. So I'm just going to take it. Um, and then at some point, like it's, uh, my brother, cause he was like my brother's friend, uh, that he, like they hung out together all the time. And then a couple weeks after that, my brother had told me that he had asked like my the friend had asked him it's like hey so do you know when your brother's gonna give me my ds back i don't talk to that person anymore <laughs> jesus fun times uh, by the way leo i tried googling Game Boy advance explode plane um and it's it's more positive than i expected but apparently it's all just about this Game Boy advance game from thq that's called games explosion exclamation point with a penguin oh, maybe on the that's what i was thinking of yeah maybe you just were really into games explosion <laughs> based on your google search i thought it was going to be like how to use a Game Boy advance to blow up oh play. yeah i totally thought so too i was very disappointed uh owen mccarter writes in and says hey mini maxis i guess that's us uh do you think the increased power and accessibility of modern handhelds like the switch and vita take away some of the novelty and charm that previous handhelds had before yes it does owen yes it does uh i think a little bit i think that the, because i think that the 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 kind of hypothetical dream of a portable console is that oh it's like exactly like the console but you get to take it with you so it's right. portable right but i think i think maybe the best games that are, that are portable are the games that take advantage of the size of the screen or like the portability for like short sessions and stuff so it almost feels like once you've accomplished that with something like the vita or like the the ds in to some degree like the first person shooter games on the ds were not great but it's right. like oh yeah you can play a ps1 era shooter on your on your handheld but it's not great or like the uncharted games where it's like yeah i guess this is pretty close to an actual uncharted game but it's like it doesn't have the fidel- fidelity that we've come to expect from those games so it's like this, it feels lesser when the when those games try to emulate their console brethren versus try to do something original. Yeah, but I do think now in retrospect, there is something so cool. And a lot of it, I think, comes down to kind of what we're talking about with, you know, Link's Awakening or a WarioWare, where seeing these big developers tackle the handheld space was an opportunity for them to get kind of freakier, smaller teams, yeah. smaller budgets. And so with that kind of going away, it's a bummer. And it was just fun to see like what these technical powerhouse developers were technically capable of squeezing onto a Game Boy, even like, what, X on the original Game Boy, where it's like that 3D game, like it has wild stuff. And so it's yeah. fun to see that experimentation. Now it's kind of gone. We should know that, like, I feel like the Switch is maybe there. Like that is, it is the conclusion of the portable saga of like, yeah. it's just the console where you just take it with you because, and it's like the same, well, you know, with some minor te- technical differences. Uh, you just take it with you and it's the same game, right? Like that feel it feels like that's what it's accomplished, but it almost feels less special because then that means there's no room to design those kind of weirdo games unless a company specifically is like, okay, we're going to make a game that is designed to be portable, but you can still, I guess, play it on your big screen. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Janet, you're a Switch connoisseur. Have there been games where they've really emphasized like, or have there been mobile only games on Switch? Uh, uh, mobile only. That's I or feel like now I'm hesitating, only? but I think I think there are games that, oh god, only. Uh, I hesitate to say only, but there are definitely games that like lend itself to being in handheld very explicitly, just based on what you need to use. Like you need Joy-Con. Like for instance, there are games that require the Joy-Con that right, you cannot play on right. your Switch Lite. Um, so on that sense, there's like limitations, but that also becomes awkward because, like Cyril mentioned you're kind of funneling people into one way of playing but your whole thing is that you can play it anyway like i think of those mario party uh games where you can only play it if you have like multiple switches and things it's like that's such a fun use of the screens and now i need everyone to have a switch and it's just kind of like 
Yeah, it, 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 I guess in that sense, things are a little bit less creative um, in terms of being like gimmicky. But I mean, I still feel very uh, limited by the Switch's power in a non-charming way. Yeah. I mean, that's why, like, what do we keep saying? It's on everything except Switch. And that's right. because it's a handheld. That's like in part, in part, because Nintendo consoles have always been like less powerful. They're just sort of doing a different thing. But um, yeah, still still limited <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i think that's worth remembering i i think um in the case of uh, the playstation vita bl- it blew my mind to be like playing an open world sly cooper game on the go and the idea of that kind of experience <laughs> being handheld like that holds i i agree that you know limitations breed creativity in a lot of cool ways but that like the depth of an experience you can have on a more powerful handheld have holds more value to me than, you know, the older pixel stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tactical Dreamer writes and says, Hey, MinMaxers, I know Serial will have already talked about Advance Wars, but I want to make sure Intelligent Systems also gets credit for how amazing the two Fire Emblem games and Game Boy Advance are. Ah, they didn't see you coming in with that juggernaut there, Serial. Uh, and then Tactical Dreamer says, I also want to shout out Dark Deity which just came out on Steam, and it's very much a direct callback to the Game Boy Advance era Fire Emblem games. Check it out, Fire Emblem fans! Dark Deity. I think it's at, like, very positive right now on Steam, but have you seen that thing, Serial? I haven't. I'd heard about it, but it it seems like something I should check out. There it is. Uh, Steven Woodson writes in and says, Hey folks, I'm currently replaying Castlevania Circle of the Moon, and it's delightful. The only tiny knock I have against it, though, is the frame rate can occasionally chug when the screen gets too crowded. But that does have a bit of a charm to it. <laughs> My question, does the crew ever enjoy when the frame rate drops in old games? Hell yeah. This that, is a good follow-up. I know, it's weird that these this two are... Is a good, are, are bad games good? Yeah, type I, of I think so. Line of questioning. I think there's something to this. Like, I immediately think of it's a sign of mission accomplished because I always see it as like my remote minds in perfect dark have all been detonated and now the N64 is when it's like four player split screen. Like when you're getting down to the single frames per second, you know you're going to have some kills because the entire map is lit in a fire now. Yeah, you associate it with I'm doing something I'm not supposed to. In right. that sense, it's fun. Like, crack down keys to the city mode, spawning a thousand explosive barrels and shooting them all off at once. Yeah, yeah. I see the charm of that. Yeah. There were there were definitely moments like Metal Slug even where it's like, it, that that is a pretty linear running gun shooter, but it feels like, oh, when the screen is slowing down, that means there's so much going on. Like, it is, you are in it. Like, it, it is serious. The frame rate can't even handle how much action is going on on the screen. Yeah, which is... But those were always the, like, okay, I have to be prepared because, like, one, I could die at any moment because the screen is really slow. But this is, like, this is the game telling me, it's like, things are really intense right now. Yeah, do you think we will see a major game release, like, on the PlayStation 5 where it really chugs? Like, charmingly oh, chugs? Not. You hope not. God, I hope we're oh. past that. It's cute. It's a fun novelty, it's but cute. come on. <laughs> Black of frames are cute. Now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if Ratchet and Clank by the end, if that wasn't slowing it down at all, when it was at 60, like, I don't know, man. Uh, but John Ford writes in, the famous filmmaker, I presume, uh, and they say, Game! <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, Xbox tells you the rarity of achievements as a percentage of players and also has easy achievements just for making progress in a game. So, using that, we can tell of Xbox players who started a game, what percentage finished different parts of games. So, for the following games, guess the percentage of Xbox players Ooh. who followed up to play the DLC slash expansion. Okay. Okay, so try and guess the number of people, Xbox players, who bought, who played the expansion. Assassin's Creed Valhalla. What percentage of players on Xbox played Wrath of the Druids? Leo, since you're Wrath of the Druids fan number one, what's that number? 25%. Okay. Surreal. 15%. Okay, Janet. Um... 21%. Serial takes it. The correct answer is 4%. Wow. Yeah, man. I knew, okay. I feel like I should have gone really low, but then I was like, may, I felt like maybe people bought it and just at least like, you know, like start, like literally started it. Yeah. But, okay. Okay. okay I'm, I'm trying to double check the wording here. Yeah. Whoever followed up to play. So it must be just when you jump in there and play it. Okay. Um, Outer Worlds. There's... The first DLC is called Peril on Gorgon. 
Janet, give me that number. 12%. Okay. Serial. 2%. Okay. Leo. 16%. Serial. Pessimistic Serial wins. That is 1.4% yeah. for Paralon wow. Gorgon. And Why did they make it? And but you know what? This, the, well, are there more? Are there uh, well, more? I was going to say, uh, currently also uh, Murder on Eridanos, the second DLC, is sitting at 0.7%. That's wild, but it, it does track in the sense that like, you know, again, I have a guides background, like having done guides for IGN and we almost never do DLC guides because no one looks them up because no one plays them. Yeah. So yep. it does, I am still kind of shocked because I feel like, but then again, it is another purchase, but we buy things we don't play all the time, like as gamers. So I, I figured at least people would have bought it. So I'm, I'm a little bit, I am a little bit shocked, but I'm not like completely taken aback because yeah, no one plays it and you know, no one's playing it because no one's looking up game help. Yep. So interesting. I really hadn't thought about it, but yeah, like, what is that value for them of it's this much cheaper to not make a new game, to just make a new chapter for this established thing that it's worth it, even if a less than one hundredth of our players <laughs> play it? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, okay, Skyrim, the Dragonborn DLC for Skyrim. Leo, it's got to be more. Okay, what are you going with? Ten percent. Okay, everyone's learning. Surreal? Uh, I'm going to go wild and say 17%. Okay, Janet? 7%. Surreal sweeping the board with 22% for Dragonborn's wow. DLC. Nice. Wow. Uh, okay, uh, Control. The Alan, uh. Wake, the Alan Wake DLC for Control. The AWE. Janet? One percent. Okay, Serial? Ten percent. This is them firing with everything they got. This is Alan Wake. Finally, crossing worlds. Leo? Well, I would have guessed definitely you had told me that earlier. <laughs> I didn't think about crossing worlds. Fourteen uh, percent. Janet with two point five percent is the winner. Way to go! Uh, thank you. Because so I didn't play it, and I love Control. But I ain't dipping into <laughs> DLC. Yeah, I'm. I so rarely jump into DLC. Even like the Yuffie DLC for Final Fantasy VII, it felt like such an anomaly. It's like, oh yeah, that's right. I'm just not used to playing DLC. It always just feels so tangential. I'm just not gonna keep it downloaded long enough till the DLC comes out, and then I'm not gonna re-download it just for some DLC. Yeah. Uh, we're spoiled little baby boys. Uh, Jake Zielsdorf writes in and asks, do you ever miss the monoculture when you could assume most people consume the same media as you? Jake Zielsdorf, I don't know if you were alive in like the 40s or 70s, but I feel like <laughs> I feel like already in our childhood, the idea of this monoculture was pretty fractured, right? Back in my day, you had one book and it was the Bible and everyone read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you feel, I skimmed it. But. Do you feel like we had the monoculture at any point in our lives? I think the closest is when you're a kid and you just have because there wasn't like Netflix when we were kids. Um, so you had like limited you had a lot of like the idea of what kids media was was very small. While today it's like kids media could just be like a YouTube channel about like making planes or something, you know, like whatever. Yeah, um, that's the closest where it's like, oh, a lot of kids are also watching Dragon Ball Z or that. That was it. <laughs> I do like Dragon and Ball no, Z is it. the monoculture. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, I don't know if I miss it too much. It's still weird to me, like when stuff pops up and becomes like a default like you know Bo, Bo Burnham's Inside is a good example like yeah I know it's on Netflix yeah. and seemingly everybody has Netflix but it's just wild that I feel like well it's just assumed everybody in our wheelhouse will have watched this but I think if I went back home and brought up Bo Burnham's Inside um, I'd be hit with a rake across the head like I, I just don't know <laughs> like is it just like this Twitter bubble where it's exactly that wheelhouse so it's tough for us to avoid but the idea of calling it monoculture is absurd yeah, I I don't know that I miss it. Um, I, th I I guess I was always like that kid who was like all my friends were into wrestling and I was just really into anime. So I just never like it never felt like, oh, I'm totally in the in crowd. And it like it was cool. It was like rare to find like the one or two people in my class that were into gaming and stuff. And so like yeah. it was like us talking about video games and everybody else was like, you know, like talking about wrestling and other like um, TV shows and stuff. Like The Simpsons was maybe the closest thing that we had of like right. Oh, everybody's yeah. movies, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, 
And maybe Dragon Ball. I think Dragon Ball was maybe the other thing that's like, like even there were people who were like, whatever, that's dumb, that's dumb and for kids. But it's like they acknowledge that it exists and it's real instead of like, what is that? What like no one's ever heard of that. Um, a lot of it had to do with the silk shirts that people wore. Yeah. Um, but like, <laughs> I think that was maybe the closest. But now I feel way better because like, even, no matter what obscure interest you have, it's like there's a probably a forum or a place to discuss it, right? Yeah. So it feels like. You can you can make that home that people had with the monoculture out of anything. Yeah, it always I mean, it's the classic example which you go back and look at viewership for like a failing TV show in the 70s. And it's like we only had 72 million viewers every night. Just mm-hmm. like, nonsense like that just makes no sense. Uh, Aaron T writes in and says, hello, cohorts. Happy birthday, Aaron T. Um, let's get to the tough, hard hitting questions. What is more important in a video game? toilets you can interact with or instruments you can interact with toilets i think i think instruments well Uh, toilets implies a bladder meter no No. i disagree you don't need who says you need to pee in the toilet to flush it you just flush for fun yeah flushing for fun is a big thing i mean we're talking about just walking up and hitting the flusher not yes if i can't flush it the guitar on the wall like i can't play that in real life it's fine not being able to go up and flush a toilet why do we even have installs here what are we doing here i feel like i don't know if i'm walking around and i'm if i'm like look if i'm in someone else's place right i don't like walk look at their toilet and think i really want to flush that versus like versus like if i see a guitar on the table or something I might like casually just like okay pluck Pee it, in it? If, oh pluck it yeah uh, pluck it just to just to see if it you know if it works or whatever even it will but it's like <laughs> I feel like works. I have more of an instinct to play around with an instrument like if I saw a but, drum kit at someone I would maybe grab one of the drumsticks and hit it one time yeah but more, for the last I'm more time likely to do that than go flush a random toilet yeah but sorry for the last no. time your life isn't a video game we're talking in video games it's a very exactly. different like, thing there are so many things in games that I do that I would not do in real life like my chores. I don't want to do that to relax. To relax, no. Uh-huh. But in Animal Crossing, I'm picking up weeds. I'm fishing. You think I'm going to go out and fish in real life? No. In games, sure. Like honestly, if I yeah, saw it's the if I saw a balloon with a present like wafting over my house in real life, I wouldn't even give it a second glance. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Wishing on stars. Real <laughs> life balloons. Let's give someone else. <laughs> Get it together. Uh, Here's the I thing, though. Um, when I think of playing instruments in games, I think of Fallout 76, you know, mm. sitting down with a banjo, playing it for 30 seconds, a buff pops up. You get a buff for playing it. I think of Sea of Thieves playing different instruments with your friends, them syncing up and playing the same song as you're going down the sea. These enriching experiences. I think yeah. of using a toilet in a game, it's what? Saving your game and no more heroes? It's yeah, picking it a turd out of it and throwing it at the wall and Duke Nukem forever? A, it's, it is a base missable. level. It's a base level of world interaction that I feel like is needed mm-hmm. to feel like everything is more than just set dressing for an area for you to walk around in. I think it makes the world feel lived in and thought about carefully. I feel like if you do, can't flush the toilet, it just seems like a big oversight. Yeah. Can you flush the toilet is right is a immersive level up there with can you pet the dog? It yeah, doesn't have nostalgia or warm fuzzy feelings, but I see a dog, I want to pet the dog. I see a toilet, I want to flush it. And it's yeah. I do want to play it, but I it it has all this baggage of now we're do- no it's just yeah. very basic flush the toilet i think yes. i'm with you i'd be more disappointed by the inability to flush a toilet than play an instrument because like instrument that's a whole other level what are you gonna have like a last of us part two style guitar otherwise it's just like the animal crossing like ring as you walk by a well, harper you hell. don't necessarily have to have like fun, a but... fully oh, functioning yeah. like system of plumbing to for the toilet to work i think i think for in terms of like how we want to interact with games and like how it, it reflect they reflect like real world real world instincts i think I, I would maybe rather have the guitar there to be playable than for the toilet to be flushed. But so we're split. That's just I, I push back that it's immersive to just be able to flush a toilet when you can't pee or poop in it. I've Who never once that? in my life <laughs> walked up to a toilet and simply flushed it. I, okay, does this thing work? Before I before I pee and or poo in it, I need to make sure this thing works. It would be sure. different, Leo, if like my character was going like, ooh, 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 my bladder, ooh, ee, ee. But like, it's assumed that my what character game is, has What game does that? That's what I'm saying. I'm and assuming- where can I get it? <laughs> I'm assuming that my yeah. character is totally cool, bladder empty, ready to go, and so this that's as much interaction as I want. It's just, okay, let's- So your, 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 co- your cool, calm, and collected character is like, yeah, I'm going to flush this toilet. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But it's and about then, doing everything you can in a given room. Like, can I yes. pick up a book? Can I do whatever? Like, yeah. 
That's that's the reason. I yep. think it's an empty interaction. You know, why would my character do this? I don't know. You know what I think about I can, your music, Leo? Maybe I think music's an empty interaction. Leo, I think we should just have our own podcast. I don't think we can talk to these people. Yeah, anymore. is there any way I can split the screen we'll uh, into do two a parts? Two episode on toilets yeah. and games. Y'all will do it too. Actually, the <laughs> you, new one would be more interesting. But <laughs> it's classic. It's classic. Can you yeah. can you do it so that like you and Janet are coming out of one ear on the pot yeah. on the audio feed, and then uh-huh. Leo and I are coming out of the other now? Yep, I fixed it for Take the video version. Out. Yep, the podcast yeah. is good now. Um, hey, Barry McCann writes in, um, and this is for the the toilet podcast. So that only Janet and okay. I can answer this one. So keep okay. it down. Keep it down. Uh, oh, Barry, listen, I'm a fan of the podcast. Okay. Hey, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, thanks. tell a friend. Yeah. Like and subscribe. No. Um, okay, Barry McCann asks, what's your favorite thing to do on a lazy Sunday? Honestly, for me, having a full bladder and flushing that toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, with the, bla- the with the full bladder? No. You're like, I'm, I'm going to flush the toilet just Excuse to tempt myself me. further. <laughs> Excuse me, instrument buddy. Keep it down. This is the toilet <laughs> podcast. Janet, what's your favorite thing to do on a lazy Sunday? Um, well, after I get up and just make sure all the toilets in my apartment are working, yeah. um, I like to just do nothing. I mean, I think that's the true mark of a lazy Saturday. Uh, but Sunday. usually, Sunday. when I'm well, act- Sunday, Sunday, right? Um, see, it's so like I'm just like it's all melding together. Um, that's how relaxed it is. But I'll usually just be like either laid out on my couch or laid out in my bed, just watching maybe YouTube videos, playing some games, yeah. like whatever feels most relaxing. In like least schedule like I like being mm. like, you know what? I think I'll just do that. I think I'll just throw on like an old movie or play whatever game for no reason. Like it's got to feel very unplanned. Yeah. All right. That's it for this episode of the Toilet Cast. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome to the Instrument Cast. Uh, I'm your host, Suriel. I'm here with my Ooh. friend Leo. We happen to be asked a question about what we like to do on a lazy Sunday. Great question. Uh, and yeah, it's a wonderful question, a podcast exclusive question for us here. <laughs> Uh, and so I think my my answer would be like I just like to watch a bunch of TV on my couch because it feels like a thing that you can just have on in the background and do passively while you're playing. Uh, fellow musical uh, instrument compatriot Leo, what do you think? Oh, uh, I love to just uh, sit back, uh, you know, read, do things like if I feel like I'm gaming all day, the day flies by, and that's not always what I want on a lazy Sunday. You know, I want that time to creep by, really really enjoy it all so a lot of a lot of uh quiet focused on relaxing time yeah. you know not a lot just of time distracting myself. to just pluck and, and mess around with random instruments around the house you know that's what it's all about yeah. for me yeah and well, I, you know what and i i'm so proud to say officially got rid of all the toilets in my house this week <laughs> Well, that's going to do it for uh, this episode of the Plucking Musical Instruments podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening and subscribing. We appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you, and we're out. This is like when they, people send the same question to Giant Bomb and then to us <laughs> <I know. laughs> the same week. Hey, everybody, welcome to the first crossover event between the Toilet Cast Whoa. and the Playing Instrument Cast. Uh, we have our first question from Victor Fam here. They write in saying, how do you filter... Oh, I'm sorry. This is from Mitch. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I botched our crossover event. <laughs> Mitch writes in and says, hello, crew. Is it a strange feeling knowing you have a following and fans, but are otherwise normal people who aren't rich and famous in the traditional celebrity mold? This is for everyone just to get really up in their heads for a bit. Um, follow up. Have you ever been recognized in public? If so, how often and how have the interactions went? Um, Thank you for reminding us that we don't have fame and fortune. Uh, right, right. That's how I like to start my afternoon. <laughs> like, yeah. All this work, none of the real clout. But um, yeah, I've had some public interactions with people. Um, I've had two notable ones. One was at E3 2019, and it was at like the Indie Mix event. And okay. it was just like a fan who was like, hey, like I, fo- I don't know if they said they followed me on Twitter or how they approached me, but they asked to take a photo with me. Uh, and I did. And then they were like, Great. Yay. And I was like, oh, yeah, thanks. And it was, you know, really nice and, and positive. Uh, the other one was also positive, but a lot more random. I went to a uh, an expo in the Midwest. I think it was, ooh, not the Midwest Gaming Classic, a different one. I don't know which one it is, but it's su- it was super small. It was essentially like in a kind of like what boiled down to a, like a gymnasium that was just used for like the expo thing. But the panels were like really cool. Like they had like the Metal Jesus Rocks crew there and stuff. And that's why I went. It was also not that far. Um, I wish I could remember the name of it. And um, someone recognized me. And what's crazy about that one is this is pre-IGN. 
pre wow. any of any of anything. Uh, I had a YouTube channel of probably like maybe 100 subscribers. What? I had a Twitter following of like 900. And someone was like, hey, are you, are you Game Onesis? And I was like, yeah, like, you know, when we just talked to the guy, I felt I watch your YouTube or whatever. And then they just want to say hello. That's great. And yeah, it was really wild. I was shocked. That was the first time I was ever recognized. Uh, so if you're out there listening and you also make content, whether it's gaming or not, and you're one of those people who's like, no one, no one watches my stuff. No one listens. But you, you know, you literally have at least a few people watching. Like, please remember those are real people who do care. And like, I know it's difficult because a lot of times people don't like comment on podcasts and videos. So it feels like, OK, I got 23 views on this, but I don't feel like I have anyone really here. But I promise you that if you stop doing that content, people would come out of the woodwork and be like, oh, I'm so sad that you're not doing like X, Y and Z. Like there even if it's a really small audience, like there are people that care and that are watching and like, I don't know, that that really means a lot to me. Um, and I've always felt that way, regardless of how high or low the views of whatever the thing I do is. And I've always acted the same. And like, yeah, so I don't know, carry that with you, because someone might someone might notice you or recognize you. Like there are people that care and think about your content, even if you're a really small creator. Yeah, that's very sweet. Um I feel like the the obvious ones like E3 would get recognized a decent amount. Like I remember a real thrill for me was I was visiting Bungie once and walking to the bathroom. To the bathroom. Mm. Typical. Yeah. Imagine. Did you see any instruments along the way or the hell no, I didn't. Uh and, and some guy was walking by. <laughs> and some guy was walking by and he's like, Oh hey Ben Hansen. I was like, Oh, hello, Bungie developer. That's very nice that you'd recognize me. Um but it's happened like Okay, tell me if this counts. One time I was at a bar with Dan Reichert in Minneapolis and somebody came up and recognized Dan Reichert and then pivoted and was like, oh, and you're Ben Hansen, right? I was like, that's like half. I don't know if they would have come up to me by, by myself, but I've had... It counts because I knew who you were. I guess so, but I've had two... It doesn't count if they ask, can you take a photo of me and Dan? Right. And they like, don't know who you are. Right, right. Uh, I've had two that are completely out of the blue. Uh, one was at a bar and one was at a brewery here in Minneapolis and it's the most flattering thing in the world. Like somebody just walks by real quick like, hey, just want you to know I love your podcast. Okay, bye. And like they always try and like run away real quick but it's like, please, I'm just sitting in a bar by myself waiting for somebody like you. Like I'm more than happy to talk <laughs> yeah. for a bit. So don't hold back if you uh, see me. No, I, I think the the last weekend I ever worked for Game Informer actually uh, when we went to the Pokemon World Championships, we got recognized yeah. on the street in DC. Wait, really? I don't even remember. Oh, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, I remember that now. Yeah, yeah. And that was like the only time I think I've ever because like obviously people will come up to you like during E3 and stuff, but that was like the first time I ever remember just like apropos of nothing because I mean obviously the Pokemon stuff was going on, but it, it like it didn't feel like they that weren't was there for that. The whole yeah, like they were there just to visit DC with their family or something. Yeah, and they recognized us on the street. It was it was wild. It was yeah, wild. God, thank you for reminding. I forgot about that one, Leo. Your I, YouTube channel's blowing up. Do you feel like that's going to result in a lot more people recognizing you? Maybe it hasn't yet. Still, the only time I've been recognized just on the street, and it well, maybe even wasn't me because it was with Kyle and Reiner at Game Informer in mm. Burbank for the Spider Man cover story. We had just landed, and a car driving past. Somebody just yelled from the back seat. Game Informer! <laughs> oh my god. And then the car <laughs> swerved towards you. It seemed like it was a bold move. <laughs> You're next! <laughs> but that was a funny moment because those cover trips are always, you know, supposed to be super secret. It's like, oh, well, well, nobody puts together what we must be here for. Right, right. Burbank. How many studios are in Burbank? Right. Um, yeah, in terms of is it a strange feeling, um, I think it's like, it is perfect. If I may recommend anything to anybody, it's to be E-level celebrity on the internet. <laughs> like, barely, because like, there's always just a hint. Sometimes, like, if somebody gives me, like, a weird look in a Target, like, in a game section or something, there's always this hint of, like, do they recognize me? Okay, no. That guy flushes toilets. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I always wonder that when I go into GameStop, like, if that would ever happen. Because sometimes I always go into, like, the same one, but right. it hasn't yet, to my knowledge. But, yeah, it's nice not to be the level, I think about, like, actual celebrities where if they go to Dunkin Donuts like there's going to be a million photos of them taken like regardless of how bad they look I'm like I cannot <laughs> live with I am glad I don't have that that sounds awful yeah for sure I uh I went to I was at a used game store in Madison Wisconsin over the weekend um and they had a bunch of old video game magazines and so I bought like some old ones from the 90s and stuff um, and then they had a bunch of old game informers and I was like, oh, I'm missing a couple from my collection. Like, so I got the Epic Mickey issue, which is like the redesign issue, as we all know, our game informer lore. And I got the Beatles rock band issue because it's one of my favorite games of all time. And I was like, oh, it'd just be fun to own these. And so I got them and brought them up to the counter. 
And I was like, oh, how much are these? And he goes, oh, he's like, they're free. He's like, there's other magazines. Ooh. I'm going to charge you for it. But like the Game Informer one, he's like, it's just some bullshit that GameStop cranks out. So just have them for free. Take them, please. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah. <laughs> much like my pictures are on the inside of this thing. It's like, all right, cool, man. Thanks. Oh my God. I wouldn't be caught dead inside of the pages <laughs> of one of these things, he said. And then he grabbed it and wiped his butt with it and flushed it down the toilet. Wow. It was really amazing. He flushed Luckily, his whole flush butt down the toilet. So the toilet it was that was all in good. the room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Y'all have something to say about that. Anyways, uh, uh, Victor Pham writes in and says, how do you filter the constructive criticisms from commenters just being mean? Does it ever get too overwhelming reading YouTube, Reddit, Twitter comments? I, I'm pretty hollow at this point, so it's it takes a lot, I think, to see a comment that makes me go like, oof, I think that's true, and I think that does hurt. But it only hurts if it feels true. If it's just some, like... Sony Pony. <laughs> Some crap. Okay, buddy. Yeah. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, I don't know. How's everybody else doing on trying to filter through that stuff for something constructive? Reddit's intense. I don't yeah. go into Reddit. Look, I, I only really go into stuff that like I have ma like made and posted, which is everything I do. But I don't go on Reddit for like where people are posting it on like forums. I just think that'd be too much work to do. Uh, for me, it's if it if it's specific, then it's in like I don't know done in a way that doesn't feel mean i think it's genuine criticism stuff like you know and i've mentioned to you to y'all like in, in meetings and things like oh people seem to you know upset that we didn't talk about this game or right. or they want to know or like the other day I, I saw a piece of feedback that was on um an episode of i think ps i love you that i did on kind of funny that was like oh i wish y'all had talked more about what was going on at the studio because you kind of glossed over it and i'm like oh, okay that's a you know i thought that too in the moment but then i didn't yeah. and that was a useful piece of feedback um non-useful feedback I hate you. <laughs> this person's <laughs> annoying. Uh, I'm skipping this episode. It's like, okay, it's not, I mean, it's not feedback. It's just, it's just someone um, like typing things. <laughs> like that's right. not anything. So right. um, that's basically the difference between the two. So yeah. Yeah. It's a nice reminder though that, um, you know, we exist as people and we're going to read, a lot of us are going to read these comments. It's like, I know it's the lamest, most obvious thing on the internet to be like, Hey, wait a minute, that hurts, but like it still blows my mind that like you're aware you're typing this in public, right? And you're you aware know, that you're an asshole right now, right? Really what's wild about that too, because like I think I'm one of the more like res hard response people. Like I do try to respond to like a lot of people and I'll like go in every week. And if you've commented, you've probably seen my name at least in there. Um, but every now and then what's wild is like if you step to someone who's like sometimes if someone's like really rude but kind of longer than just like i don't like you i'll maybe go more in detail about like an actual response like okay like here's what you're what you think and like this is my sort of rebuttal and where i'm coming from and like my background or like whatever and i i'm always i always try to be really respectful of that even if someone's not respectful of me because i feel like it's almost this weird customer service energy like where i don't know i don't want to just curse people out i feel like that's also weird yeah um and every now and then people will literally respond like Honestly, man, I was just tripping. Like, I actually watched it and it was awesome. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, and people will just backpedal when they realize that you're a person. So, yeah, y'all should remember that. But if you don't, <laughs> occasionally it like snaps people out of being mean. It's the wildest thing. Yeah. The other form of backpedaling is like, oh, I didn't think you'd see it. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Right. That's, I feel like those are the biggest pools of commenters of criticism, really, is like constructive criticism, which I think it's pretty easy to tell who's like trying to help or who's just being a dick. And it's constructive criticism and people venting, which being confronted, they'll backpedal in one of very many ways. But then there's a much smaller portion that's like, I'm trying to hurt your feelings and <laughs> I will double down on that. And those are people you definitely have no reason to try to impress. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, let's keep this rolling. Uh, Bryce Blackmore writes in and says, Hey, everyone, I just signed up to the Patreon yesterday. That's all, Bryce. Um, but <laughs> after watching so much content and seeing the interactions y'all have with your community, whether it be on Discord, YouTube comments, Twitter, or Twitch, do you ever worry about the parasocial relationships which can form? I asked this after watching a super insightful video about the rise and fall of the McElroy's brand. Uh, I, I, I by Sarah at, Z, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm like Great halfway video. through it uh, right now, and it's it's very educational because like, oh, I like them, I really like their TV show, and I've listened to a couple episodes of my brother, my brother and me, but like, I don't really have a sense of the arc, but who knows? Uh, but I'm looking forward to watching the rest of that. Anyways, um, so Bryce says, are there things you can do to minimize feeling like a parasocial relationship is forming with your community? Are you conscious of it? Has its impact changed the way you engage with your audience and what you choose to share? Big question. 
Yeah, uh, Leo, uh, you know, not too long ago, we were standing in a backyard talking about this very concept about what do we do on our end? How do we make it safer for everybody and more comfortable? And like, I don't know if you have any big new thoughts on that idea. It's really, the more I think about it, the more it's, you know, just so built into the nature of this business of being a, a personality that people like because they relate to right and and in that sense it's hard to build it in a way where you won't have parasocial relationships yeah. forming but you just have to be conscious of it and not like over like i don't know what i'd do without you guys oh i love you so much right right and like you know yeah i mean we've talked about it before about like even trying to not go out of her way to be like you're you're my friend you know person online leaving a comment it's like it does get tricky and so it's that weird thing of like oh we are big on building a positive community in the discord but it is important for everybody to realize that like it does not mean that we are intimate best friends i know it feels that way because i feel that way with people i listen to but it can get weird and it's never gotten too weird for me but every once in a while i feel like i think this is slipping a little bit towards that line and yeah, it can right. go both ways too like mm. it's important to like you know a group of people supporting me in the way that they do it's like it's an emotional thing it's a meaningful yeah. thing and so you have to be conscious for everyone's sake to yeah. not be forming these unhealthy relationships i think that it, it is important to for, for us especially like i i think i have a pretty like I, maybe you and i hansen have a pretty good understanding of like how that relationship works because we've listened to a bunch of other podcasts and i feel like if I, I feel like I have having done this and also having listened to stuff like that. I feel like I'm in a pretty good position where if, if I approach someone that whose podcast I listen to, I think I would be pretty aware that's like this person doesn't know who the hell I am. Like they, right. they don't care, uh, it, like especially with like the bigger the podcast or whatever it is. So I feel you like, can just say blank check. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we've had them on the show, because so that's act slightly different. <laughs> we are their best but, friends. Yeah. Like, look, like Michael Barbar does not know who I am. All right. I'm not I can't go <laughs> off to him and say like, hey, what's up, pal? You know me. Hey, here's what uh, else you need to know today. Back off. <laughs> exactly. He, he phrases every sentence that way. Somehow. <laughs> uh, but like, I, I feel like it like for our, on our end, I think it is important to acknowledge that it's like y you have a little bit of power because I, I know recently there have been like kind of certain controversies about people kind of abusing that uh, that position to get like take advantage of fans and do things that like are probably pretty uh awful but like i think that we in terms of like preventing people from establishing that relationship i think we i think we do a pretty decent job of saying like hey we this is things he, here are things we are doing for you um but yeah not getting into that whole like yeah you guys you guys are the only reason i'm here which i think happens a lot with with twitch because i think that is what people want is like they they kind of want someone to digitally hang out with right you know, to be right. able to disconnect the second right like and i think twitch maybe has a I, I think it is a lot more intense on twitch than it is maybe for a podcast where it's like you're you can more you, you're interacting them with the with them live and so you can ask them questions and if you're a solo streamer who does that and that's kind of your main thing it is very easy to go down to like well what's the best way to get engagement is to share a lot of personal information and kind of bounce off of people and that that's where I think it might get a little bit kind of dangerous of like, oh, I interacted with this person one stream. So now they think they know me. Right, right. And yeah, Janet, I feel like we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with Sarah Pizorsi talking about Twitch and like what the right level to reveal about your personal life is. And it's kind of related to that, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of what y'all already said is the same sentiment I have. Um, for me, it's just sort of establishing boundaries while also still be like, being like a really friendly person. Um, I spend a lot of time on Twitch and you do you do really get to, you know, feel like you know people because yeah. you start to connect the dots on like especially if you have recurring viewers where you start to just get a sense of like who they are and sometimes people will you know trauma dump and things and that and that's why personally for me like i i guess i just is you know you have to decide how you want to run your community like even stuff like you know i am pro like mental health but i I'm, that's not part of my brand and i i'm very clear on that i'm like nope I'm not going to really talk about this at length because I'm not a professional. If you want to do that, you got to go to therapy. Like, yeah. that's not a me thing. Uh, I know some streamers aren't like that. And hey, that's their choice for that can of worms. But it's something that I very strategically veer away from. For me, I also just try not to use like 
you know, saying like friends or whatever, like I need, I try to veer away from that. And I think what's really, what I've liked in my own community is I feel like people have been really respectful of that. Like yeah. I've even had like, um, one time I went into, uh, one of my like followers streams cause I watched some of their streams too. And someone was like, Oh, you're friends with Janet. And they were like, um, I mean, I wouldn't. And they like, it was interesting. Cause I could tell they didn't want to like be rude and say that they weren't fr- like right, friends with me, but they didn't right. want to say they were friends with me because they know that we have like an internet only content creator to consumer relationship. Um, So, yeah, I really like that. But then I I think it does get complicated when um, especially like in our industry where like Cyril, you mentioned like, oh, well, we had them on the show. Like sometimes you do meet these people and then sometimes they can become your friend. But I think the thing is, is to be very clear of never, ever try to be someone's friend through the content. Like, I think, you know, Mm. I'd be lying if I said that I didn't become friends with people where I had consumed their content prior, but I was not listening to the podcast thinking, I think we'd be great friends. Let me like insert myself into their lives because that's when it becomes like creepy and weird um but yeah that's basically that's basically it so i try to leave i guess one thing i do is i'm a lot like more i guess nitpicky about when someone would ever cross over that line for me and it would take so much more than like having a non-internet relationship where you can casually meet someone and then they're your friend but on the internet like my barrier to entry into actually being someone I consider a friend is so much higher because of that. And then there's the other layer of like being a woman. And there are always people who will be like the amount of times that like it, people have been like, Oh, I'm sad. She has a boyfriend. I'm like, I don't want to read that when I'm like doing the news. Like that's right. super weird. And that's yeah. something that almost ever happens to like men, despite how like, you know, traditionally attractive or whatever they may be. That's very, and that's something that like, I don't know, I push back on that. And I think my community pushes back on that. And I'm very like, I don't know. You have to you, you can't prevent everything. There's always an inherent danger. But I think drawing those lines and really being firm on it um, on both ends is good for everyone being safe and having a fun relationship with content. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Having fun with the community. Yeah. Is paramount. And that idea of the friendships within that. That's where it gets murky. But yeah, it's a it's a weird fine line that I'm sure everyone's trying to navigate in their own way. Um, okay, let's keep descending into this uh, dark rabbit hole. Solo submits a comment on Patreon and, and asks, if you were an NPC in a Nintendo game, what would you say? Try jumping. What's that? Try jumping. Try jumping. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, could you do that as like a Nintendo NPC voice, though? I feel like it'd be better. <laughs> oh, and then it's like text. Be okay. voice oh, interesting. Okay. All right. Um, but yeah, that's actually something that uh, one of my community members, uh, Eddie, AK played forward, is always also a mod for me. Uh, his com- his troll comment to me is always try jumping, even if the game like doesn't have jumping in it. So that's, that's good. why that's that good. Was my that's NPC good. phrase. I think I'd be just a nice generic. Look out! Yeah, you know, that's just so accurate. Yeah, three Thanks exclamation points. Yeah, yeah, but no explanation of what I'm talking about. I think is kind of my move. Uh, I, I would I would make a noise, but it, I would have a whole line of dialogue. So I would be like, oh, but it like the, the dialogue would be some explanatory. Did you know that if you the way you can save in this game is to go and pluck the instrument? Yeah. OK, I love that. That's cool, man. That's smart. I would be some, what, some animal. I'd be a seal and I would make animal puns and be like, don't forget to seal the deal and stuff. And you'd go like, oh, I bet. Yeah, probably in the original Japanese. That's like a really funny laugh <laughs> line, but just it's a translation makes it kind of lame. There that's so good. I hope that works for you, Solo. Uh, Kyle- I guess you see the deal ha- have like red text. And it's like, is that supposed to mean something? Shit, is this part of the puzzle? <laughs> this Kyle Silva writes in and says, I got a game for y'all. I'm going to name a property that is represented in both in video games and film slash TV. You have to guess which version has the better aggregate score. Hope you're ready. All right, Leo, which has a higher aggregate score on Metascore is the the metric here. Ratchet and Clank, the 2016 movie or the 2016 PS4 game, which has a higher score? Wow. The game. Correct. That's 85 to 29. Great call. Serial, the toughest one of the evening. King Kong 2006, the movie, versus Peter Jackson's King Kong, the official game of the movie on Xbox 360. Which has the higher score? I'm going to say the movie. The movie by one point, 81 to 80. And I would argue that that should 
be very much flipped. That one point deserves to the game's favor, because I don't know how well that movie's aged, but that game still rules. All right, Janet, this is the game you're born to play. Detective Pikachu, the 2019 film versus the 2018 3DS game. The film. The game at 71 really? Metascore. The, the movie is 53, apparently. And oh, wow. Is, wow. The weird thing is that on Metacritic, I think the, the game score is yellow, but the movie score is green, right? Oh, I don't yeah. know. I That's kind of where it? my head was at, because I know a lot of people did not vibe with that game, but it's also very much like a kid's game. But then mm-hmm. it's like, what does that really mean? Like, is it is it a kid's game or is it just a bad game? Like, I don't know. Like, it's a little it's unclear. Like, it was Metacritic is... Metacritic has that weird thing where it's like the the baseline to be good on to be considered good by Metacritic is higher for games than it is other mediums. Oh, uh, okay, that's weird. Um, okay, Serial, The Witcher, season one on Netflix versus a 2007 PC game, The Witcher. I would say the, the oh man, I, I'm gonna lean on the game. Smart. That's at 81. Season one is 51 on Metascore. Mm. And Leo, That's really surprising, yeah. For the yeah, grand finale really here, uh, Leo, Napoleon Dynamite, the 2004 movie versus the 2007 DS game, which I did not know existed, and I looked up gameplay. Three years later, yeah, <laughs> it, it's weird. <laughs> In man. case you missed it, what <laughs> took them so long? Uh, I'm gonna go with the game. Incorrect! The movie's at 64 and the game's at 45. Although, they point out that IGN div- did give the game a 7 out of 10. So, hey, way to go, IGN. Defending Napoleon Dynamite the game. Uh, thank you, Kyle Silva, for submitting all these wonderful games. What do you like for Question of the Week? The toilet one. I mean, I feel like you gotta go toilet, right? Uh, the musical instrument one? Yeah. I think <laughs> no, 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 we're talking about the toilet one, actually. <laughs> no, the toilet one. I guess we'll have to split it, and half of the prize will go to Aaron T, and the other half will go to Aaron T. Congratulations, you get the physical version of the Pathless on PlayStation 5. And also, happy birthday. There we go. It all works out. The parasocial relationships one, though, was great, too. I could talk about that topic all day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm definitely interested in watching the rest of that. I've enjoyed the video. games this week, too. Excellent like games. Game once. Excellent games. Uh, now it's time for something called Get a Load of This. Again. Uh, Leo Vader, you got one, dude? Get a load of this. You guys remember when, just like we all remember when we had a monoculture, do you remember when people were sending children through the mail at the dawn of the Postal Service? I do remember that. Yeah, that was fun. That's how it was There's an interesting article in Smithsonian Magazine, A Brief History of Children Sent Through the Mail. <laughs> And it was pretty much in under the first year that you could su- send large packages. Uh, people would send like their babies to go visit their grandparents <laughs> through the mail. Well, and they really? would write it up in the newspaper as like this cute thing that happened. But it happened a good few times. But yeah, less than a year, they made it illegal. Oh made it specifically illegal. God. But the article says the reason was that people just... That was the level of trust people had for their postal workers back then. And like they weren't doing it randomly. They were like, I will trust the our local postal workers to do this, to take care of this child on the train or whatever. That is so insane. Uh Sergio Vasquez. I I I think we've uh talked about them a few times before, but the uh, the Video Game History Foundation has an excellent podcast called the Video Game History Hour, which yeah. is like Honestly, unlike every other video game podcast out there, it's so good. A a deep dive into uh, one particular, like very obscure topic, and you know, they're they always bring on someone who has done the research, and it it feels like this like almost mini documentary esque thing. And a lot of those people are like there basically to talk about documentaries they've made about that topic. So um, their most recent episode was about, or the one maybe before the most recent episode was about the, to go along with our portable theme for this week, the, uh, Nokia N-Gage, which was like their failed portable handheld that was like a phone, but also had games on it. And so they talk about, you know, a lot of the memes about it and, but like how it was uh, like, oh, well, technologically they, it, like it actually had a lot of going for it. It was like pretty competitive. Um, but they just like kind of completely biffed it when it came to like marketing and selling that uh selling that series or uh selling the phone um but it, yeah like all all of those episodes are usually like really fascinating listens that you don't get from a, a lot of other podcasts that's true so and recommend I, it. 
I've been on two if you want a great entry point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, video game history hour. Check it out. My get a lot of this was also in fitting with the portable theme. Oh, mm, smart. Yeah, baby's on the go. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Baby advance. Uh, let's see. Uh, Leo, do you want maybe a basic one about etymology or something about corporations? Uh, give me. Yeah, I always go corporations. Yeah, that's you, baby. Uh, hey, corporal guy. Here's the future of Dreams, everybody. On the PlayStation blog, uh, they announced a collaboration between Dreams and Mercedes-Benz. Where the... I'm still a little confused, but they're like building worlds within dreams that are about envisioning the future with the help of Mercedes Benz. Yeah. So hope anything to make, you know, dreams more profitable for Media Molecule and Sony, I guess I'm all for. Get it back on that radar. And this is the future, baby, is some sweet Mercedes Benz crossover content. It's like when Breaking Bad had that ridiculous cold open with the Dodge Chargers revving for two minutes. <laughs> it's like whatever gets them the money to make the rest of it good. Or or in that last season where they had uh, one of the characters play Rage, but it was an arcade shooter. It was like a light gun arcade. game. Yeah, yeah. right. Absurd. <laughs> uh, Janet, you got one? Yeah, get a load of this. Uh, Angel City FC, which is going to be um, a new National Women's Soccer League team that's uh, they're dropping in 2022, so pretty soon, uh, unveiled their official logo. And they have like their official like ethos of how they designed it and what the, they want the team to stand for and everything. Uh, you know, LA, if the Angel City thing did not tip you off. But I actually wasn't even aware of like this team like rolling out in, in just next year. So I'm pretty excited about it as someone that uh, moved to LA not too long ago, though. I'm starting to feel like it. Now, God, it's been actually a year. No, I've lived here for a long time, but it, it, it's all compressed because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. of COVID. Um, so I'm excited to like have soccer back again in a way that's not extremely dangerous to attend. So yeah. yay. Uh, and I know soccer is like not, you know, as popular to Americans, but um, it's a lot of fun. So there yeah, it is. Check it out. Links below for all this fun stuff, including one from the community posted in the wonderful MinMax Discord. Um, Ninjan posted this. Uh, it's a tweet uh, letting people know that Reddit dug up footage of the Spurs playing StarCraft 2v2 between games of the 1999 NBA Finals. Uh, this tweet says the trackballs, mice, the old laptops, the intro music, Timmy getting mad, losing to the Admiral. It's all amazing. So if you're a StarCraft fan or an NBA fan, it's very fun. It's like this two-minute video where it's like, an edited package of them getting really competitive, sitting like in a hotel with a trackball mouse playing 2v2 StarCraft. It's a, it's a great time. And then uh, after that, like they, they've spent the first 20 minutes of the next match just sitting on their side of the court, not doing anything. And then they launched all of their players on the other <laughs> side, which they had actually created multiple other players. So yeah. it was like 30 players against yeah. their five. It was really cool. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. Plugs, what do we got coming up? Uh, I'll think of some things right now. Uh, Minmax Council, which is our Patreon exclusive podcast. Uh, the last episode was a very fun one. Every uh, At the end of every month, we do the big community call-in where everybody at that $20 tier can call in and talk about anything under the sun. And this last episode was a blast. I did it solo, but talking to everybody from the community, like three people called in with trivia games, which was very fun. Like uh, the guy who won, El Jefe Mitch, who won the last episode of Trivia Tower, he called in to quiz me on stuff and i'm very proud of the fact that i did all right i did better than expected so i proved that i am an official worthy host of a trivia show about video games so you can check that out in the patreon exclusive podcast feed speaking of trivia tower we have the new episode of trivia tower happening sooner than you think i believe it's going to be monday july 12th will be the next episode of Trivia Tower. So if you support us at any tier on Patreon, you can jump in and win an Astro E40 headset. Uh, we have a bunch of great game codes to give away, including game codes for Star Scarlet Nexus, the new game. So we've never really given away a fresh new game before on Trivia Tower, but if you make it to the upper floor, you can win. So we appreciate the support and we appreciate you proving to the world that you know a thing or two about video games. Um, does anybody else have something to plug? Janet, what, what's going on with Kind of Funny these days and you? Oh, yeah. Hello. Uh, I am the interim or whatever co-host of PS I Love You, uh, preparing for Greg to leave for paternity leave. So I'm on uh, those episodes. We those air on Tuesdays. 
Um, so yeah, now um, someone did tell me that I am only allowed one Switch reference per week, and it has to be on this show. Okay. So I'm gonna try to keep that in mind. That's how I'm now gonna gear everything. So I'm gonna dump all my Nintendo stuff out here. Yeah. Um, and just keep my PlayStation stuff there so that everyone's happy. Right. Um, but yeah, that's been that's been really fun. Uh, and yeah, it's been it's been a while since like I've really enjoyed like this whole year of just getting to podcast more. It's my favorite thing to do, and I didn't do as much as of it as I would have liked to at IGN. So it's nice to to be doing it all the time so yeah, yeah congratulations that's super cool thanks um let's see other things we have a new episode of better quest coming up on thursday our show with jeff cork which is all about setting personal goals for yourself every single month so if you want to set a personal goal for yourself in july you can you can also jump in the next discord if you want to talk about it with the community put it in a spreadsheet all that fun stuff uh it's an easy way to hold yourself accountable for actually sticking with a goal so we think it's a system that works pretty well so thanks everybody for watching better quest it's also available as a podcast in the patreon exclusive podcast feed on tuesday leo we had an interview go up with mark dara from bioware um he left bioware after being there for 24 years um and he was a little cagey ahead of time about how much he could say about being the executive producer on anthem and working on dragon age for all these years um but he seemed really like an open book. It's an interesting discussion about crunch uh, within Bioware, his takeaways. Uh, he talks about uh, a game that was unreleased, but they were building a first-person space sim set in the Mass Effect universe for the Nintendo DS. And it's called Mass Effect Corsair. And so he goes into details about how that would have worked. It was like, it took place in Batarian space and you're like selling secrets back to the Alliance and stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting stuff in that interview. He talks about what went wrong with Anthem, regrets along the way, his biggest mistakes, all that fun stuff. So you can check that Did out. something go wrong with Anthem? Oh, we'll tell you after the show. Um, but that's on our YouTube channel uh-huh. and then also in the Patreon exclusive podcast feed. Uh, so thanks everybody for checking that out. Also, we have a new episode of Crossfade, our music podcast going live on Friday. Good God, there's a lot of stuff. Um, and I forget... The guest's name, I remember it's a very impressive person, but I'm not hip enough to remember the name. Mike Park uh, is going to be on from Asian Man Records. Uh, He's a musician himself, and they'll be talking about Alkaline Trio and the Exploding Hearts. You can subscribe to Crossfade on your favorite podcast app uh, to listen to that show. Janet was on an episode, I think it was the last episode, right? Yeah, I think so. Sweet. Uh, Anything else we're missing? Any other plugs for people? Oh, we have Max Spoilers for Metroid coming up on Friday. Yep. Leo, how you doing, man? Great, man. Thanks for asking. I'm working on my new personal video, youtube.com slash Leo Vader, the perpetual plug. Sweet. There we go. Thanks so much, everybody, for uh, letting us uh, fill you full of plugs. Also, thank you to the thank you crew, people at that $50 tier over on Patreon. You know who I'm talking about. It is Alex Payne, Fixture Gaming, I Am 8-Bit, Best of the Rest Podcast, Call Me By Your Game Podcast, Mercurico Torreno, Real AF TV, Zachary Pliggy, Mark Seliga, Beaten Down Brian, Ludwig Roque, Juar Hello, PrettyGoodPrinting.com, Andrew Ukrowitz. Where are we up to, Leo? Uh, here? Yeah, okay. Andrew Valla, John Higby, Yarrow, Richard Smuts, Clint Farley, Spiral in Your Eyes, Pruthum Yar Legata, Starkiller, Spider Dan, Purebred Number 6, Slick Nick, Steve Bam Dad, and Jesse Vitelli, and your name here. Thank you so much for your support, everybody. We appreciate it. Be good, have fun, let's go! Let's go!